Tony, could you please call the roll? Jimenez? Perales? Here. Cohen? Here. Carrasco? Davis? Here. Esparza? Here. Arenas? Here. Foley? Mahan? Here. Jones? Present. Licardo? Present. Thank you. Form. Thank you, Tony. Um, Councilmember Foley, forgive me, were you um, completed with your remarks? Yes, she was, Mayor, with I think four seconds okay. remaining or 10 minute estimate. Okay, great. Um, then Councilmember Sparza. Thank you. Um, I thought she needed wanted to talk about arts. So did we cover all of that? Me? Yeah. Hey, Councilmember Foley, yes. Did you did, did you speak get it? Did you I thought you had more that you wanted to cover. Uh, yeah. I was finished. I had a question for Sam, but uh, oh. Nancy took care of it. Or do you want me to pose it again, Sam? Well, Mayor. if you feel it was answered, I'm happy to move on. But if you <laughs> like me to answer, I'm happy to do so too. <laughs> um, actually, I will ask it. It had to do with the Yigby, Yes in God's Backyard conversion plan, hiring yeah. a consultant for that. And then also the PQP conversion policy for a school district to use the consultant for that as well. Is, is that contrary then, or does that mean you're putting the current proposal that staff's been working on on hold, or what's the status of the current PQP policy? No, I, I know that staff has spent quite a bit of time um, engaged in discussions with superintendents and others in, in the community. And I expect that will continue. Uh, the idea was that since we know we've got some, <clears throat> some churches, and particularly I'm thinking about Cathedral of Faith, that's quite interested in building 100% affordable housing on their parking lots. Um, and, and if we were able to move relatively soon, the idea would be to see, since, since this issue around churches, although not exactly the same as that with schools, but they're certainly similar enough uh, we're probably going to want to be thinking about them together in some way. Uh, and so after some discussion you know, through different channels of planning staff, I, I, I think that is their intention as well. Nancy, do I have that wrong? That's correct, Mayor. The, okay. I've got a little uh, research done over the break. And the, the notion is that because we did do outreach to the school districts, we want to do a, a similar outreach to the churches, and there are many more of them. So in that part, if we can extend staff by using a consultant to, to help us uh, both gather data and share, I, uh, exchange ideas, that's the purpose of the consultant as I understand it. Okay, and then is the idea that the policies would come together at some point? I mean, they're two separate types of current, well, they're not really different land uses, but the conversion is going to be the similar land use. Yeah, there, there may be some similar principles there. So uh, obviously, they'll, assuming that they're both relatively fully baked, they would come together, I would assume, until, unless uh, rules says otherwise. Okay. I think that was pretty much it then. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Customer Sparza? Thanks. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure. Um, Thank you. So uh, I actually wanted to, there's vice mayor. So I actually wanted to apologize because I had looked at the big map of our um, equity and, um, and thought that Cadillac Winchester was included. And so thank you to Kip for um, getting into GIS. Um, but just to show that data might bring out um, and teach us other things, the, the, that, the neighborhood actually wasn't Cadillac Winchester, it wasn't all that close, but it was the Buena Vista neighborhood. Um, and so I think it just illustrates the point that um, you know, having that sort of data approach will show us, um, you know, I think a lot of what we do know, um, but uh, bring back some of the issues that uh, you know, we're, not, we're not used to talking about all the time. Um, although I don't think Buena Vista was its own SNI. Um, anyway, so I just wanted to apologize to Vice Mayor uh, and thank no you for, for correcting that. 
Um, and so I also want to thank the mayor for focusing this year's budget on um, our hardest hit communities. Um, I think uh, there's been nothing normal about this past year. Um, and we have seen that chasm. Uh, we always had an inequitable or not always, but for, well, you know, we've had an inequitable city, um, but what's happened in the past year, um, it's not unique to San Jose, um, but we've certainly seen those inequities grow. Um, and communities like mine and, and like Cadillac Winchester have borne the brunt of these inequities um, that have been highlighted due to the pandemic. Um, and so I, I just want to talk a little bit about the um, why the uh, we brought forward that um, that definition of high needs neighborhoods. Um, so those are designated low resource by the California Fair Housing Task Force. Um, and so I just the state has used that data to develop a housing methodology, a transportation methodology. And so that was the line of thinking. Um, and thank you to Kip again for reviewing it and kind of tinkering with it. Um, and I look forward to getting a refinement of that methodology so that we don't lose a lot of time on that. Um, and we can take action while communities are still suffering. Um, also, along the same not lines, we propose directing the newly created data scientist to collect, review, and report data to our council to ensure an equitable standard of service is delivered across our communities. And as the mayor's memo did state, we can no longer rely on anecdotal evidence provided by city staff or the community or even council members to distribute our limited resources. And that way, um using data to drive our decision making it doesn't depend on who blows up the mayor's cell phone um i know he's had that happen quite a few times to get his attention um and we really need to be better um i uh wanted to uh talk about the uh, walking beats a little bit um i appreciate the mayor including the walking beats um funding for walking beats in last year's budget were not fully utilized because they were slowed or suspended um, due to COVID. I know in my council district, we went about four months with no walking beats due to COVID. Um, so I um, thank you, the mayor. I pulled the report to PISFIS that showed the actuals for 2020. And I think the mayor's office did that as well. And so I appreciate that there's a little bit of leeway because of that. Um, the, the actuals are not going to be accurate for the coming year. Um, so I just wanted to point that out. Um, I wanted to also thank that last year we funded walking beats. Um, thank you to former police chief Eddie Garcia who made that commitment um, to have walking beats. It's the city's first permanent walking beats with Vietnamese speaking officers in Little Saigon. Um, and they're amazing and I've gone out with them. And I can tell you personally, they make a big difference in the community, um, in the, the community folks that are there and the business owners trust, they know the officers, they trust the officers um, and have developed those relationships. Um, I just wanted to state that as the mayor stated in his memo, the walking beat sites should be based on need. Um, again, uh, you know, the walking beats that I have in Santee or in Seven Trees or in Alma, or in Little Saigon or up along Story Road, it's not a special thing. Um, all of District Lincoln is within District 7. Um, and that police district has 25% more police responses than the next busiest police district in the last fiscal year. That means that SJPD responded to 5,000 more calls in one year in that police district than any other police district. So I just wanna make sure that when we're selecting areas for walking beats, that we're allocating our limited resources based on that need um, and not based on the squeaky wheel methodology. Um, and I had some questions about, um, where's my stuff? Um, I had some questions about the resiliency core, Mayor. Um, 
So the, um, I just wanted to ensure that citizenship would not be a requirement to participate. We run into some of those issues with our workforce grants um, where citizenship is a requirement. And I wanna make sure that that is not going to be a limitation imposed on the Resiliency Corps. Yeah, I'm not sure if it was in the budget message or not, but I know it's been in other documents that we've put out, particularly in trying to pitch for state funding that um, this would be open to all community members, regardless of status. Now, there may be some restrictions on FEMA reimbursements in terms of who can work. And I, I don't pretend to know what the answer is to that. But if there's some string that's attached to the source of funding for that, for those workers, then we may have some constraints. But the intention is that we'd want to ensure this would be open to everyone regardless of status. And so I don't know if this is a question for Lee or someone else, but could we um, deal with that on the back end? In other words, in around the funding for it, because I know we have our accounting, our COVID accounting. Um, is that something that can be dealt with on the back end so we can um, offer it to all? Yes, um, I believe it is. And it's part of the discussion we're having with the county and it's been part of the discussion we've been having with the local FEMA office as well, um, because we do believe um, not just with FEMA, but some of the other funding, funding pots that have had those limitations that that's gonna be changing with the new administration. So I think that's something that can get cleaned up. Um, but uh, per the mayor's comment, I think uh, EOC and the recovery uh, branch have been looking um, at this as inclusion for all. So I think from a financial perspective, we just clean it up in the, in the long term. Okay, thank you. Um, and then I also wanted to ensure we have a lot of parents um, who aren't working and are worried about paying their bills and feeding their children. Um, will those parents also be able to participate in the Resiliency Corps? Is that a question for me or for Jeff? Or? I, I, I'm looking, I, I think yeah, it's your I mean, mus message, so I, I'm yeah, in terms ask of my you message, or Jeff. Yeah, my message was, uh, let's focus on young adults. Some of them will be parents, uh, but it doesn't have to be exclusively young adults. And the, yeah, the reason I, I, that, I, I, Oh, go ahead. Yeah, just a, a, the rationale being, uh, look, we know there's gonna be, there are 45 year old parents with kids and they wanna work and then let's let's go forward. but. The idea of at least focusing on young adults is that we know that's a part of our community where we see really a huge spike in unemployment. And we also know that there are just really painful downstream effects when you have a failure to launch in that generation of those folks in their early 20s who are stuck in unemployment and they're just not able uh, to get any traction. We, we pay for that for the next two decades. And so and so that's why I urge the focus. Yeah, and I'll tell you my preference is to include, if we make it include all, that we include all. We have, I, I don't know about other districts, clearly I messed up district one, um, but uh, I, uh, in my district, I have a lot of parents, a lot of adults who, who don't, can't get enough hours, um, who, need to work and we really need to employ those parents because if they're not, you know, if you're above 24, you still have bills to pay, you have children to provide for, and we need to make sure that those children aren't in the street or living in some kind of crazy living situation, which we already have and we don't need any more of. Um, so I, I wanted to bring that up and I, I request that that not be limited to 18 to 24 year olds, but we yes. recognize that. Yeah, yeah no, it's, it's, we're, I, as I say, this is not an exclusive focus. The idea was just that we would reach out for young adults. Again, some of them may be parents already. And yes, it would not be exclusive. Yeah, and I understand it's still being shaped. So that's why I wanted to bring that up. Um, and I, I had a, another question, which is about the math. <laughs> so at $23 an hour, 400 full-time jobs over one year, without health benefits or operational costs would cost over $19 million. So how, how would that work? Can, can you help me understand that? Yeah, my understanding is we're starting this with FEMA reimbursements. Um, and I know the county had uh, urged to, for us to go find 
250 people who support back centers and outreach and testing and so forth. And so there'll be some money from FEMA reimbursements. There will be obviously this pot of money. And then we're also looking for other sources. And so the pot that's identified through this budget message, if it's approved, is 20 million. Uh, and then obviously there's all the, the FEMA that I mentioned. We're also, uh, as mayors of large cities, we've already pitched the governor on this three or four weeks ago, uh, asking to uh, be considered uh, given the fact that the state has several billions of dollars of federal money as well to allocate. Uh, and we're also going to the feds through an infrastructure bill. Okay, so um, it's not gonna be the whole cost. And, I, I, and I'm confused. So on the, the request for mutual aid for the 250 positions, I thought we were going to first offer that to our own part-time workers. That's what we had discussed at council. Could yes. somebody fill me in? I'm looking at Kip. Yes, uh, we, we are, we expect to, we, we've actually pretty fully deployed those workers in all sorts of other things. We will be offering anybody who's on our roster who wants to do that, the opportunity to do so. We expect that maybe we'll get a dozen or 20 people that way, but we'll, we'll take all comers that way. And then we will begin hiring new people essentially into those same types of part-time positions, focusing on um, recruiting from the neighborhoods that have been hardest hit by the pandemic. But those expenses, as uh, the mayor mentioned, are, are uh, um, will be fully FEMA reimbursable. So we'll figure out a way to, to front the money because it is a reimbursement, but ultimately the cash flow will even it out. Okay. Um, well, I look forward to seeing that play out. Um, I will, I do want to remind folks that we're looking at a deficit. We have 22,000 low-income families owing a combined 83 million in back rent in between the county and county's pot and our pot um, of the rent relief package. We don't know what the future is gonna hold um, and those numbers are not enough to pay for the back rent that everybody owes. Um, and hopefully if they get a job, they can pay it. Um, all right, so I have one last thing. Um, and so that is about the SOAR program and restoring our parks on the Coyote Creek Trail specifically. So the city's, um, our city's trail system could be one of the city's greatest attributes if our residents felt safe using them. We've done a bunch of surveys throughout the city um, that have shown us that our residents don't feel safe using our trails. Um, and I recognize the challenges that Councilmember Perales faces with the Guadalupe Trail. Um, but I, I did want to ask um, to make an amendment um, because the Coyote Creek is getting connected to the Guadalupe. And, um, and so this new trail, which I want to remind folks um, the county accepted a grant in 2015, um, which most of that money went to pay for per, a permanent 162 unit permanent supportive housing project in District 7. Um, and then the remainder of that money is used, being used to construct this trail um, that's connecting essentially the Guadalupe and the Coyote. Um, and so just to ensure the tens of millions of dollars invested from multiple different agencies in, in our uh, creeks, um, I wanted to ask for an amendment um, to direct the city manager to add the Coyote Creek to be included along with the Guadalupe River Park. And I wanna, I'm leaving that open-ended um, because I understand there's some analysis um, that needs to be done and that will be done. Um, so that's my amendment. Okay, Vice Mayor? Yeah, so um, actually I'd like to, um, I'm very open to it. I'd like to hear from the city manager if uh, he has any thoughts or input on that. Um, thank you, uh, Vice Mayor. I don't I have any concerns with it. Okay, well, I will accept that. Thank you. And that's it for me, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councilmember Perales, uh, thank you for your, willing to, your willingness to concede uh, your slot uh, for others. <laughs> now your time's up.
Yeah, thank you. Um, I just, I think I agreed with him in regards to when I had raised my hand, and I know that all those hands had disappeared. So, um, so a couple things. Um, number one, um, I, I appreciate the, the four kind of uh, base principles within your budget, uh, supporting the equitable recovery. Um, and we just obviously included that as one of our new priorities. Um, and we know that that's gotta be a focus for this next year, no doubt. Uh, as well as the back to, to basics, um, cleaner, safer San Jose. I think that uh, we've seen the impact on our community. We know that this has been building specifically as well when it comes to the inequities and in more so in other parts of our communities. And, uh, and that again, being exasperated last year. Um, and I think that that has to be a focus. So I appreciate that as well. Certainly uh, the other exasperated, you know, um, pre uh, pandemic issue uh, is with homelessness and uh, the lack of affordable housing. Um, and, and then finally, uh, as I think you have always been within your budgets, looking at uh, the future and, and resilience. Um, so I, I do appreciate the, those, those four basic principles as you've started off your budget. Um, a couple questions diving into some of the areas. Uh, the resilient, uh, Resilience Corps, I guess I'm just a little confused in regards to the number that we're talking about based on how I'm reading it. Um, and I'm curious, how many actual jobs are we talking about? Just because we've seen it, it's a, it's a couple times, um, if it's within your report and uh, I'm looking at it as, you know, is it 200, is it 600, is it 640 based on the numbers I've just kind of put together? So what yeah. is that, that that we're aiming for with this program? Yeah, thanks for the question. So uh, for clarity, where I refer to specific minimum numbers, for example, for helping with learning loss, I think we indicated 50, um, that would be within the number, the total number. I'm not asking for in addition to, because obviously that would require money that, that doesn't exist. So the idea is that $20 million would be allocated through this budget um, and plus a significant amount through FEMA reimbursement. And that would be the bare minimum of funding that we would have with that bare minimum. Uh, I think the number uh, you know, we could reach would be four or 500 uh, without too much difficulty, but obviously that's gonna depend on supportive services and lots of other things. And I know Jeff is working hard and sharpening his pencil. And this is just for one year at the moment. That's right. And that's why we're really engaged in this lobbying effort to see if the federal government will look at this as a, a demonstration site that um, is something they should replicate in other cities. And they're, they're interested. We just need to push. Okay. Um, uh, certainly supportive of it out the gate, but I just think that we should be conscious of, of some of the potential challenges. If it does remain just one year, you know, what kind of um, uh, message are we, are we going to be sending to the, to the, in those that we're employing through this, um, ensuring that they're aware, right, uh, that this is not something that, you know, may not be long term, right, it may really just be that one year. And, um, and then additionally, seeing if, right, if we end up getting more resources, um, I think it, you know, it, it, the focus initially in recovery, uh, but if, but if we start to branch out to some of these other support areas, um, I think it would be wise of us, uh, to try and include that as a multi-year effort. Uh, but I know that at the moment you're looking at it as just one year. Um, but I would, uh, it, you know, we, we don't know what's going to happen from now until when we approve the budget. So I would just say for the city manager to keep an open mind in regards to, something that might be a multi-year effort. We've done that before with one-time funds. Um, and I know you're asking for, and I'll, I'll ask it at the end, I'll kind of go in chronological order here, but I'll ask it at the end in regards to the 80 million that you're asking is a set aside. And so just um, wanna make that statement. Um, for our Office of uh, Racial Equity, um, I do uh, want the, the city manager to um, address any additional funding. You've asked the city manager to come back um, and, and be able to report with an MBA on, on that. I mean, we know that this is brand new office and so certainly uh, aren't expecting miracles out the gate. But uh, at the same time, I do think there's also a lot that we're throwing at the office 
and potentially even more than what we we have funding for. And so I want to see that that is included in that MBA. Um, and then additionally, we we is it true, Dave? We did now we have sort of placed the Office of Immigrant Affairs under that umbrella of this office. Has that been done now? Yes, it has, Council Member. Okay. And so um, in addition to that, uh, and something I'd like to add, Mayor, to um, to the request for uh, looking at how we can better serve our community members with uh, disabilities. Um, for me, I would like to see if uh, a, a future existed also under the Office of, of Racial Equity, um, potentially an accessibility officer. So maybe not necessarily an entire office in itself, but uh, but I mean, that's what the, that's what the Office of Immigrant Affairs was at one point, right? Was just one individual um, or even a, a partial individual that we funded. Um, and I know you're you're asking for some steps that uh, that may precede a decision like that. But I think if we're going to include that analysis, I'd also like to see if if there's an opportunity uh, for us to to just look at what it might cost to go a little bit further with that. Um, and um, Councilor Pearls, can I, can I respond to that? Yeah. Um, I think that's a good idea. I, I think we ought to put it front and center in front of staff and, and ask staff to come back to us and tell us, you know, is that the best approach? I, you know, before we decide to go off and fund it. I mean, maybe we set money aside for that, for whatever the, the solution is, but I think it's something we want to just look at all the options on. Yeah, I think, you know, from what, research I've done and what we've heard from from uh, advocates in the community, I think really having somebody that that's, that's their role so that we can incorporate that into many decisions that we're doing. I mean, that's that's right along the lines of, of why we created this Office of Rac uh, Racial Equity. And, and so I think that, um, you know, it just, and, and it doesn't necessarily have to live under this umbrella of that office, but I, I do think the idea of uh, an accessibility officer um, would would be worthwhile of seeing uh, what that looks like as well. And I know that it wasn't included within your language as one of the, the avenues that we should be exploring, um, but I think it, it could be interpreted that that, you know, that that could be one thing. So I just wanted to make it explicit that that is something that staff also looks at. No, I agree with that. I assume that's okay with the maker of the motion. Yes, it is. Okay. And, and I'm sorry, I didn't ask for the, maybe uh, I'll let the seconder see if they're comfortable with that. That's fine. And then the first one, I didn't ask for that. I'm sorry for, for just exploring potential for um, for, for multi-year resources uh, um, at a one-time basis. That's fine too. And the second or two, it's fine. Yes. Thanks, yes. sorry. Um, okay, and then uh, in the section you have of, of equitable uh, budgeting, um, you know, we know again, kind of we're, we're at the early stages of this. We haven't, you know, seen the full inclusion of these equity screens on all of our budgetary items. I think there's also some though, for instance, what we're not necessarily including in, in these budget discussions, but um, tax measures that have helped us to pay for pavement maintenance um, or measure H and, uh, and, and affordable housing dollars. And so I think that, um, it shouldn't necessarily just be looked at as, as maybe the traditional budgetary items that we're funding, but really, as I think we've talked about in the past, uh, all the services that the city goes through that, that uh, could benefit from having this equity screen. I had a, a long conversation with DOT about it at committee um, in regards to how, um, you know, we, we're, we're not quite there yet. And, and hopefully by next year, um, you know, they, they are incorporating a little bit of that. Uh, equity work, but it, it didn't even make the report this year. And so next year, part of the goal is just can it just make the report in regards to what their an analysis looks like. And I, I see that that's what you're asking for here in your budget is well, let's also report out on, on some of this. And so, uh, but I just wanted to make sure that it's a it's a broad look um, uh, at where we're applying this screen and that we're, we're not necessarily confining it to just these traditional budgetary decisions that we make, but that there's also pre-existing dollars, for instance, again, like the tax measure money um, that, uh, that, you know, we have other routes on how we, we bet out how we're using that, those dollars. And so I, I would love to see this, this actual screen. It should really be in my mind, um, almost everywhere with our programs and, and, and funding. Uh, and so 
Um, I don't know if that needs to be a. Okay. Councilor Cross, that's consistent with my understanding. So if there's something I wrote there that suggests otherwise, and I understand that. If that if that clarity helps, and if you think that's consistent, then I don't think we need. I need to ask for a, a friendly amendment. So. Okay. Um, it just wasn't clear in my reading of it. So, um, and then I uh, I also like the suggestion. We've talked about this before as well on on ensuring that we have the equity lens or screen before uh, if we need to have any cuts. Um, obviously, and that's um, important as well. And, and thank you for including that. Uh, in regards to the the foot patrol, um, I think it was Dan Fam, um, a business owner downtown, uh, but came and spoke and just talked about how uh, obviously he was supportive of it, but al also how um, he really hasn't had any any you know consistent relationships of officers that you know he can point to, and um, and that's disappointing because as you know, Mayor, and for most of our colleagues, we've been funding the foot patrol in downtown for over five years, and so so um, I know that this may be a you know, newer opportunity for other parts of our city, which is a benefit, but it doesn't speak well to the program overall. And I know that that's what you and I have had troubles with before is that it's really been a roller coaster ride in the downtown core. And the yeah. fact that it's been there for over ha half a decade and we have a business owner saying that he really hasn't had that, you know, consistent interaction shows that it's not really successful. Um, if we've had foot patrol officers now for, for half a decade in downtown and we haven't had, um, we, we didn't have a you know a prominent business owner here to be able to say hey yeah you know I, I actually uh, have seen it and it's worked well instead he was saying I you know I want to see those officers and I want to see it work well which is what I want as well um, hey bud uh, hi uh, okay. <laughs> sorry that's the definition right. um, oh, oh you're trying there you go <laughs> sorry um, torturing of children going on snuck in on me there um so uh i think for for certainly for the foot patrol look i i support i've supported the program for a while it just is not as successful uh now that we've been through it a number of years and uh i will support and i do support this funding that you have in there because i think this is a, a stop gap to what the real solution is and uh thank you to council member davis uh co-signing the memo with me really looking at how we can how do we take it to the next level with foot patrol? And, and the challenges that I've seen uh, are that when it's the overtime model uh, and voluntary signups, uh, what you get is you get inconsistency and you don't have accountability. Um, it's random, whoever signs up and it doesn't necessarily mean it's the same people. Um, for, you know, council member Sparza may be seeing success this past year, whether you get some uh, Vietnamese officers being willing to do that and it's working well. Um, but it certainly does not still have the consistency in the accountability baked into it because it's not a permanent spot. It's still just overtime. And so once you know people decide they don't want to sign up for that anymore, we run into the issues that we've ran into now uh, of this roller coaster ride where some sometimes it works well in downtown and other times it doesn't. Uh, and then additionally, what I was thinking was that you know this should really be something that we look at when we do our uh, redistricting to actually create permanent foot patrol beats um, in parts of the city where we think that it could really be beneficial. And it sounds like this, you know, it, it has been beneficial in other parts of the city rather than just downtown. And so it really should be broad. I didn't see that included, but I know that the city manager is supposed to be responding as the direction came out of rules for from council member Davis's and, and mine's memo. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that that is something that the city manager, uh, this is more of a question than for you, Dave, that that, that is something you'll be responding to with uh, an MBA. Yeah, I, th I think that's my, that is my understanding um, that we would be coming back with that information. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, in regards to the em emergency interim housing, um, and uh, obviously Mayor and I are working on another site right now in District 3, uh, and I do support the, the funding, uh, continued funding for those efforts. What I'm concerned about is obviously the recent uh, news uh, on the, the wage uh, and working condition violations that, that were just made public. And, uh, and certainly, um, you know, th these have been uh, a bright spot of this past year on how quickly we've been able to move, creating these sources of housing. Um, I, you know, much like when we had our very first permanent supportive housing development, Second Street Studios, um, I tried to work very closely with the city staff and developer team, ensuring that everybody knew that, you know, when you're the first out the gate, um, 
you really have to ensure that you don't have major issues because you're setting that example moving forward and others are, are now going to say, well, here's the problems with that, whether it's problems in cost, uh, problems in product, and in this case, problems in, in the management and oversight and, and some violations. And so, uh, and this is obviously, these weren't the first, uh, we, had, we had the first one uh, over in District 3 by the, the uh, VTA lot, but, um, but these were sort of the first of this newer, quicker model that we've been utilizing under the pandemic. And um, I just want to make sure that, right, and it sounds like obviously we are and city staff responded to that last week. Uh, I believe Matt Kano was responding to that, but we need to ensure that that, that is really a, a focus. Um, I was glad to see that, um, you know, that the wage theft item still ranked rather high, but, but it's not necessarily right in our, our, um, our work plan for next year unless, right, I mean, work will continue, but it's, it's not up there currently as the the top priority it's again as on sort of this this waiting list seat and so uh i think in this case though for the in emergency interim housing we've seen the challenges uh so i think before we get this next one in investing for this next one we need to address that uh if, 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 if i could council i just want to you know kind of reiterate what, what matt said last week though for, but for these projects we are they are city projects and we are doing our proactive enforcement engagement. So we, we will be able to stay on top of, of these projects. I, I can assure you of that. Okay, thank you. Um, and then uh, this, the, I think there's a, a bit of a, a back and forth on the issue of sanction encampments versus now what we're calling source sites or the service services outreach assistance and resources sites that we have. Um, and, and I do support you know, what we've been doing and, and certainly the funding that's suggested. What I, what I don't necessarily support and where I've had a challenge and shared this with the city manager in their office all last year and mentioned this a number of times, but I think the major difference between um, the two models, if you will, of, of, of sanctioned campus versus source sites are in the very first step, which is selecting of sites. And in one case with sanctioned encampments, we would be selecting sites that we would then say could be deemed sanctioned encampments. And then they probably, you know, didn't have to look much different than our source sites today with the amount of outreach and services that we're providing, uh, albeit we have selected the site. And so uh, that could bring with it um, a lot of benefits. On the other hand, uh, what we've been doing with source sites is we've essentially just defaulted to allowing our unhoused residents select the sites. And where that puts us at a disadvantage are in a number of ways. For instance, number one, simply in uh, trash collection and cleaning the locations, uh, like the mayor and I were, were doing um, this past weekend, um, when we allow our unhoused residents to choose the sites, uh, we end up with a lot of sites as we've had now right along our waterways, uh, polluting the waterways, harming wildlife. We end up with locations um, that are under our flight path, as we know where we're getting uh, you know, being required by the federal government to abate, uh, so sites that are not, not even a allowed. Um, and so we have these challenges of sites that are difficult to bring services into or to do trash pickup, sites that are more challenging to uh, the environment or sites like the, the one under the flight path that um, even if we wanted to try to keep that and provide services, we couldn't because we're being required to abate it. So where I go back to is well, why, why aren't we choosing at least a couple sites first and specifically under this regard, and, and Mayor, you mentioned it in your, your memo, we've talked about, about this, this FAA requiring us to clear out a site now, which has potentially over 300 individuals um, that in my mind, we should be identifying locations where we can relocate these individuals to. Um, and you mentioned about maybe funding some more source sites, uh, maybe a couple more I would say we go one step further and we don't just fund them, but we identify where they should be. So it's not just, let's just go find where the next biggest encampment is and then fund it with some, some services, outreach assistance and resources, but let's actually help identify that. Um, and fortunately, right, we, we have uh, a, a, the topic on discussion on the 23rd um, from the, the prior memo that I have written to, to rules. We just ranked uh, the, the, the memorandum from Council Member Foley and Mahan uh, that we combined essentially with this very topic in mind. So I think all of the, the, the energy and the commitment is now there. I think the challenge is, is, you know, that first step, the difference between that first step 
And whether we want to call it sanctioned encampments, uh, an encampment management and relocation program, or simply a SOAR program, personally, what I would like to see is that we just take the initiative to identify some of these locations first, as I've been advocating for for, for years. Um, I think we're almost there. Uh, what I would hate to see is that we, we go out and we provide these resources, once again, in sites that, that are not um, are not preferred uh, and have bring with them just additional challenges. So I, I would want to ask, um, you know, I don't know if this should be better discussed on the 23rd. I don't know if there's anything that yes. really the mayor needs to change in his message, but I, I obviously want to be able to, to have that uh, as a discussion. Yeah. Councilor Cross, could I maybe just offer a perspective? I, <clears throat> I think, look, this is a good discussion to have on the 23rd. Uh, the point of the bu budget message was to get the resources to actually expand the source services. Um, and, you know, the really important question is, where are those sites and are we going to agree on them? Um, and, and you know better than anybody how hard it is to find sites just where we're going to build housing, uh, let alone where we're going to put a bunch of tents and that's that's really the issue i know that we got to grapple with so i'd like to defer that question in the meantime let's get the resources so we at least are able to do it and i just i, I guess i wanted to be sure that that the language doesn't preclude us from doing that and right now based on the language that i'm reading in your memo um you're sort of bashing on the sanctioned encampment model and, and it I sounds am. like yes. as though that's that's not going to be a model that we, we we would be willing to fund but i i quite honestly don't see much different from that versus a source site, besides the fact that on the sanctioned encampment, we're identifying a location first versus on the source site, we're allowing yeah. our unhoused residents to identify location. So that's it. I wanted to make sure that yeah. we're not precluding that is something to be funded. I, I guess, you know, look, I, I don't doubt that we could probably end up in exactly the same place, <laughs> um, regardless of the terminology. The problem is the word sanction has meaning. <laughs> it has legal meaning. Um, and um, you know, we've got an entire zoning code and planning department that focuses on what's sanctioned to go where. And I think we're going to have real challenges if we decide ultimately we're going to have create legal entitlements to use land in particular ways, as opposed to simply saying, look, we're recognizing the reality that's, that's here in our city, which is too many people are living outside. And if they're living here already, we're going to at least ensure they have basic human needs met. And I guess where I'd just like to, and I'm fine with the, the verb, you know, the verbiage or the terminology as well, right? That it doesn't have to be called sanctioned encampment, but where I want to interject our decision making is at that first step of we shouldn't just necessarily be responding to wherever unhoused people decide to go and then create a source site out of that, that then brings with it again these other challenges like what we dealt with this past weekend, or at this, you know, the, the site that now we need to clear. And so that's really yeah. where. You know, if we can create that opportunity and still just have them be source sites, but we've now sort of directed people into locations that, that we can keep a source site and manage a source site, um, in my mind, that, that, you know, that's a step that just one step that we have not taken. And I don't care about the terminology. I think if we can take that step, uh, then that's really what I'm looking for. And I'm willing to, you know, expand on this conversation on the 23rd. Yeah, and I'm happy to support. Uh, the identification proactively of a source site, um, but I'd be surprised if it's not already a site where somebody's living on it. <laughs> yeah, I well, I guess what my challenge is right is that, and that's fine. Maybe it's a site that gets a little bigger, but we we may have a couple hundred people that we're going to have to displace over the you know, course of this year. Yeah. Um, we're not going to be able to put them all in in tiny homes or where you know hotel motel vouchers. Right, there's, there's likely going to be uh, you know people that we're just displacing. I'd rather not do that. I'd rather have a you know, an additional option for them, if, even if it is just another sore site, but let's, you know, let's have those be identified first before we're just sort of saying, hey, wherever you go, we may have another sore, you know, site and we may end up start providing you services there. So, but again, I'm happy to expand on this on the, on the 23rd. Um, there was one issue and I don't know if Olympia is here or somebody else can answer, but uh, I was looking for some of the, the the data, and I was getting data that we're collecting maybe 80 tons of trash a month. Your memo says 125. Um, you know, uh, the latest info I had gotten was 80. If uh, I don't, I don't, I don't care who it is, but if somebody can share, maybe it's from your office, Mayor, what what the actual data is, or if Dave or uh, sure, I, we're getting it from the same place you're getting it. So uh, there may be a mistranslation on our end. We can. I'm happy to ask our team to. 
give okay. you wherever we got it. And that's not a big issue. It's just, I want to be factual. And I, I do think we're doing a lot of really great work. And when I saw the difference to every, what, what, what I was, the information I've been sharing uh, was 80 tons. And so if it's 125, I would prefer to share that if that's the case. So, um, so that'll be to, today for yourself, if you don't mind trying to get that, that info. Um, and then uh, the investment in the public restrooms, uh, certainly supportive of that. And I'm actually, I'm happy, right, that we continue the support for the sign intensification, which we know can generate funding for uh, both maintenance of our pre-existing public restrooms, but also would be a model that would allow us to put in some more. Uh, I know that's different than, you know, this model, but I think that both of them can help create what we're trying to create here, which is a public restroom access. Um, and uh, we haven't had that funding before. I think with the funding to be able to manage uh, these, you know, and maintain these these public restrooms, um, then we can we can obviously create even more opportunities for them and, and, and keep them working and functioning well. Um, and then lastly is the 80 million in reserves. Just kind of curious where you got that number from. Um, I was looking at, at yeah. the memo and kind of looking at, you know, the trajectory for the five-year forecast and then trying right. to get an understanding of how much money we were going to get from the feds. And just, so I don't know if, you know, if you can describe that, but that it's not, yeah. not described in, in the memo. Yeah. I mean, I, um, so I, I, it wasn't my bookie. I can tell you that we, um, we, we reached out to Jim Shannon and, and Jim and, and huddled with the city manager's team to figure out really uh, what do we want to put aside for what we know is quite possibly going to be a very rainy next year as well. Uh, and so, Jim, do you want to speak to the 80 million? Yeah, thank you, Mayor. I think what we were, as we, as we put this budget together, um, you know, we're, we're mindful of the fact that we've got the ongoing shortfall, which is pretty significant, but then have the significant influx of one-time dollars. So, you know, what is that balance to make sure that the city is, um, you know, protected so that we can continue to provide those essential city services, but then potentially, you know, leverage this um, American Rescue Plan funding for maybe over a multi-year period to sort of, you know, bridge us through. And so, you know, we have a couple scenarios going back and forth. Um, you know, there's not probably a magic number, but, um, you know, the number that the mayor suggests here of 80 million, um, you know, provides, you know, I think we provide both a significant cushion to um, future revenue shortfalls if something is different than what we expected, which is totally possible, right? Um, and also gives us a little bit cushion to adjust some of the other funding that council may want to for some of the economic relief um, as conditions evolve and we get more information about both the conditions and the eligibility of funds. Because that's another question mark is we don't really know yet how we can use these funds exactly. So that's really going to be coming from the treasury over the next 60 days. So, you know, we're going to try to release this proposed budget, you know, in accordance with this direction that gets passed here to the best of our ability with a lot of gray marks and question marks. Um, so that's, that's the backstory, I guess. Okay. Um, yeah, I was looking at the, the, you know, the, the base optimistic and pessimistic cases for our, you know, future years and trying to get, I, my understanding is maybe we'll be getting, you know, 110 million or so per year over the next two years from the feds as, as a breakdown of the money we're getting. Uh, um, and so just was trying to determine how that was projected. All I would say then, because I know this is fluid, would be that we're not married to that $80 million number. Uh, and, and I don't know if that was your intent, Mayor, but um, I would, you know, I would like to see that we're, we're sort of flexible with that. And then additionally, more importantly than being flexible and not married to it would be let, if, if you could, um, Jim, just be able to come back with a, with a better analysis as to whatever number we end up with, if it is 80, uh, a better analysis describing why. Right and 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 really so that way we have a, a good understanding of it. So uh, and that that was it in in, in that regard. Um, and if that's I don't know if Mayor you were yeah I guess I could say you know maybe not married but certainly seriously dating if not engaged to eighty million. Um, and obviously everyone the world's going to change dramatically again in the next month or two by the time this comes back. So hopefully we'll have a clearer picture. And if we're in the middle of a boom, uh, as we'd all hope, though I know that's not likely um you know maybe that number will come down so okay and then what about just having it at least obviously having um you know uh, the, a better reasoning detailed as to how we get to whatever number it is if it remains at 80 million 
I think we should be seeing um, sort of the reasons why we think that 80 million is the number. So. Yeah, and that's fair. And let me just articulate what drove me to say 80 million makes sense is if you look at the optimistic and pessimistic scenarios for our ongoing uh, deficit, uh, Jim, I think it was, was it 72 or 73 million was the pessimistic for this coming year. Um, and 78. Oh, 78. Thank you. Well, that's, yeah, roughly in that, that ballpark. And so, you know, just knowing what we don't know, that, that's what, what I was planning for. But the, the 80 million was meant for future deficit, right? So it wouldn't be to address. Yes. But if we assume that this is an ongoing 50 million and we're only solving it with one, let's say we solve it all with one time money. Now, ideally, I'd like to solve it with some ongoing savings too. But let's say we solve it all, well, then that 50 million continues next year. And the question is, what does the economy look like next year? And we all hope there's going to be a rebound, but we could see a financial market crash too, because there's a lot of commercial property owners that haven't been paying their mortgage in a few months, right? Those kinds of things. We just don't know. Okay. And that, that kind of analysis, I think in writing, whether it's your final message, Mayor, or from the city manager, right, uh, maybe to, to expand on this through a, a, a you know, a, a manager's budget uh, addendum to just be able to describe, you know, here's why we're at this 80 million. Um, again, I think we will know more in the next couple months. So I think it'll be a little easier to articulate that. So I just want to ensure that we articulate it as, as well as we can, because right now it is pretty vague and again, rightfully so as to, to why it's vague, but um, I'd like to be more clear so I understand it better myself. And then so I can articulate that better to my you know, constituents to be able to say, here's why, here's how we were being, uh, you know, fiscally conservative and why we were and why we came up with these numbers um, and what really we think the, you know, the, the projections uh, are going to be moving forward. Um, none of it's going to be perfect. We know that, um, right? That's, that's the whole, that's, that's the whole thing with budgeting is we're, we're assuming a lot of things. Um, and so, uh, but, but as, so long as you're comfortable with that, that we can explain that a little bit more in detail um, and to hear at least, you know, that we're not necessarily married to, believe me, I would marry 80, 80, 80 million if it was coming my way, but um, at least to hear that you're sort of just uh, engaged to that idea at the moment. Um, you did much better than that, Councilman. Hey, hey, uh, uh, Councilman, if I, get, if I could just offer that, I think, you know, the American Rescue Plan will be a big component of the, the budget, so we'll make sure that it'll be featured, I'm almost certain, in the transmittal message um, that will, you know, that's that summarizes the whole budget. So we will, instead of doing an M MBA, we'll have it as sort of part of the main trans transmittal because it'll be so key to what we're doing. Perfect. That, that'll help then. And, uh, and thank you, Mary, Mayor, Mayor, you're right. Uh, in case my, my wife sees this, uh, she is priceless. And so uh, <laughs> we are... <laughs> It's important for all of us to stay married. Yes. All right. Thank you. That's it. <laughs> thank you. Councilmember Cohen. Yeah, thank you. I, I want to thank you, Mayor, for your um, budget message that includes, obviously, those main categories that we all think are really important for our community. Um, I just have a quick um, suggestion, piece of input about police staffing. We don't, it's not really much in the budget about police staffing, but you know, we're going to talk later about the um, staffing and expenditure audit and you know, there's the $47 million of overtime. I, that sort of ends up as, I don't know if it's unbudgeted or budgeted overtime. It seems to me that we ought to strike a balance with you know, hiring more police and reducing our overtime expenses. And, and that might be a, something we can put into the budget to try to reduce that use of overtime and, and actually get more police on our, on our, stat, on our force. Um, so just something I wanted to I wanted to bring up in the context of the budget, and we'll probably discuss later in the context of the audit. And that's all I all I have. I, I yeah. appreciate most of the comments of everybody else. I also appreciated the discussion between you and Councilmember Prowess about um, you know the, diff, diff, the the semantics of sanctioned encampments uh, versus SOAR. Again, not important to me, but in, you know if we're identifying SOAR sites, and I think that's important for us to identify more and and spread them around the city more. Um, in some sense, we're sanctioning those locations, but however we define them is not, not relevant, not really that important. It's, it's about making sure we have services for our community in place. So um, I look forward to that discussion next week in more detail than that. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, and just on the first point you made, uh, the points are well taken. The reason why I didn't 
delve into that. And, and I, I'm as frustrated, I think, as anyone is about the, the overtime issue. Um, and we'll certainly be talking about it, in, in, I think, in the next item. We, we are, you know, without the one-time federal money, we'd be looking at reducing uh, the number of ongoing, um, reducing the, the size of our, of our budgeted positions uh, in the department. Um, and one-time money is always a bad uh, way to allocate, as you, as you know well, um, ongoing FTEs. And so um, I didn't put anything in there because I didn't think there was anything we could sustainably support. Uh, and, unless you want to, and, and even on the federal money, I think there are restrictions that have to be spent before 2023. So you can't just line up a whole lot of one-time money and say, this is going to be our, our way to fund police staffing in the future. So. Uh, you know, we just need to do everything we can to try to generate revenues through the old fashioned way, which is economic growth uh, and, and hopefully grow this department. And obviously we've passed a couple of measures in the past to support expansion and we may have to do that again. But for now, I just didn't feel like it was safe ground to say, let's go expand. Yeah, I, I just, just, I mean, it seems like we're fooling ourselves a little bit because we're spending that, you know, the, the money's coming from somewhere and whether it's, you know, clearly not one-time money if, if our overtime expenses are increasing every year. So to me, you know, we're putting it in the budget somewhere, pulling it from the budget somewhere. So yeah, we just need, we need to figure that out. And, and I assume that our budget is estimating what we're going to be spending on overtime or else we, you know, with, even in normal times, our deficit would be much greater than it's projected. And we're usually much better at estimating our deficit, which means we're estimating our overtime expenses. Which means we should it's a fair it. point. Right. Yeah, it's it's a fair point, but I do think that audit, uh, at least on the face page, is a bit misleading because um, we were beginning to decline in overtime expenditures, uh, and then we ran into last year, and overtime budgets blew up in every major city police department in the country because we had civil unrest. Uh, and so there was a trend that I think we had started for a year. The problem is we couldn't continue it even as we were staffing up. Uh, because we had civil unrest that was putting hundreds of officers out there night after night when we were getting, you know, intel reports about about looting in, in far flung parts of the city. So, uh, you know, I just I think that is, you know, not a good year to use as a baseline. Right. Um, and and we were, was yeah. a downward trend in, in overtime the prior year as a result of actually staffing up. Okay, right. So, so that's the, the whole point is we're staffing up to reduce the overtime and we should continue to have that in our budget that's the plan because it still makes sense and it does seem that even if we're on a decline we will still you know we still know that we're going to have some level of overtime that we're expecting so it, there should be some way to do an analysis i'd like to see that analysis of where that's what yeah. it may be for us to staff up we know we have need we know we're understaffed and rather than kind of relying on this overtime that we seem to have been relying on at some level for a long period of time there might be an opportunity now to, to try to find that that that's point of at least that sweet spot in the budget. Yeah, that's a very fair point. And it's not until recently that we've really maxed out on our budgeted positions. Um, so it's never been an issue for us before because we were hiring as fast as we could in three academies. Uh, so we never got to that point where, hey, let's think about how we move this overtime budget over to actually hire more people. I think that may be something that's sensible for us to really take on in the next year. And um, you know, I'll let Dave, anybody on his team respond. Well, yeah. Go ahead, Dave. You have something you wanted to say about that? Uh, Dave, you're muted right now. Yeah, thanks. So I think the conversation you're having is 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 right on. We were working to drive down overtime. The mayor is right. We we never really had this issue before where we were fully staffed, so we were actually using salary savings to fund the overtime. Um, we, we do find ourselves in a situation of, of being fully staffed. And so we, how we manage that overtime, I think is much more of a relevant subject for us to really talk through. So absolutely. Yeah, good time to have a conversation and I look forward to yeah. some more analysis as we get to the budget adoption. Thank you, Councilmember. Uh, anything further? No, that's all, thank you. Okay, Councilmember Carrasco. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, I'm. I don't know if I, am I unmuted? Um, <coughs> you know, I'm going to keep it very short because I think that 
I'm going to I'm going to try and keep it very short because I think this is barely our first agenda item. Uh, and so we have uh, uh, the rest of the items. Uh, and, you know, uh, Mayor, I wanted to thank you for um, I think uh, it's it's a thoughtful message. Uh, and I know that this is only the first discussion of many that we're going to have in the coming weeks, whether it's in our own uh, uh, BAs, uh, our own uh, I, Brown Acts, or it's uh, out in the community, um, or it's here in public. <clears throat> we have much to discuss as we're trying to figure out how we do best by our city and how we help our residents recover from a very, very difficult year. Uh, and as we had just uh, two grueling days of uh, prioritizing many very important issues, uh, the same goes for, for a, uh, a budget. Uh, a couple of things that I just wanted to, to point out um, that stands out for me. And, uh, and one is, you know, I appreciate the, the four different categories that, uh, that you kind of laid out as we look at, at your budget message. Uh, but the first, real, the, well, all of them really, uh, I think, you know, uh, can stand on its own merit. But the first one really stands out for me uh, as one that uh, has been working uh, this past year uh, in a community that has been hit so very hard due to the pandemic. And of course, you know, we, you know, I'm starting, you know, I feel like I, I, I sound like a broken record and I apologize for, for sounding like it's just, you know, I'm just on repeat. Uh, but, you know, th these are issues, of course, that we've been dealing with pre-pandemic, pre-COVID-19, but they were exasperated as, uh, as a result of the pandemic. Uh, and, and now we have families and entire communities that are, are at a loss um, when it comes to uh, really thinking about what their future is gonna look like. And for us, us as a city, trying to really wrap our arms around this community is, uh, is something that we really need to think through. And we need to make some very, uh, uh, some very thoughtful decisions because we don't want to repeat. We don't want to repeat the past. Uh, and one of the reasons why we've had to deal with, uh, with uh, the ramifications of, uh, of, of uh, what this community has been dealing with is because of the decisions that were made in the past. And so the east side, I've said it before, the east side was, was not an accident. It's, it's uh, as a result of, uh, of, uh, of ordinances and policies and decisions that were made not necessarily by us, but were made by previous administrations and, um, and were created um, as a result. And so, um, so uh, when we look at the budget and we look at equitable recovery, I, I, I really appreciate because I, I do think that language makes all of the difference in the world, how we march forward, how we view things, the context and the narrative. Uh, so, uh, you know, my, my council colleagues have, uh, have voiced most of what I wanted to point out. They've, they've you know, um, I, I'm trying to figure out how, uh, how we're, we're laying out a ground a foundation so that uh, we're not uh, caught in a in a worse situation when we have such um, limited sources to begin with. Yeah, I guess if I was just to add anything, certainly the the soft story program work is is still on the roadmap. Um, and yes, we we are we do need funding for for the work, but the policy work I think. We still intend to pursue, recognizing though, um, the, you know, the policy work ultimately just lays a path forward. It, but without funding, we're we're not going to accomplish the real objectives of making everyone safe. So, but it is on the roadmap, and, and we will still continue to work on that. Uh, okay, so maybe then the other question would be uh, if if this is um, if we're looking for for funding of any sort. I don't know if this is if this would be FEMA kind of funding or what. What exactly we're we're hoping to to be able to get into our coffers in order to get that work moving forward. Uh, for me, it's it's uh, about emergency preparedness. I don't know how else to get these families in secure buildings. 
Yeah, I'll, I'll ask Kip to kind of jump in and help a little bit. You know, I think there's there are these kind of two bodies of work, the policy work. The actual retrofit work will be massive in cost. Um, but Kip, you want to jump in? Yeah, so we, we actually just uh, reached out to FEMA again today on this. The initial work on the policy side would be uh, FEMA funded through the grant, and we'd have some some small work, excuse me, some small funds from that grant to also do some pilots. The idea would be that that um, we would create um, a path forward for people to do that retrofitting on those on those buildings, and then we would also be looking for additional funding to try to support um, a subset of those buildings to make sure that the, and figure out ways that landlords could uh, either get loan products or other ways of financing that retrofit. But we would then set a timeline on it if, in, in the ideal where there'd be a, it'd be a mandatory retrofit program that has to be completed within X years. And we would try to create as many mechanisms for landlords to um, avail themselves so that there wouldn't be a financial hardship for them or for their tenants. Um, we do need to get this going. It has been lost in the files of FEMA for a very, very long time, um, but we have it on the roadmap, which means that we will drive it forward. I agree with you completely. This is a huge item. We we think that there are over a thousand uh, uh, soft story buildings, which would be at significant risk, and that is huge. So this is something uh, that we will be driving hard through the roadmap and we'll be happy to, to give you more details. I'll be reaching out to FEMA personally uh, to follow up on this if we don't get a positive response from them. Soon. Yeah, I, I don't want to spend much more time on this. Uh, um, I just, uh, I guess I just want to put a bug in your ear then. Uh, and and the, this, you know, the, the resiliency core uh, convo started uh, a lot earlier this afternoon. Uh, I think it was with council member Arenas. Uh, and, and, and I don't know how, how it transitioned into the idea of, um, you know, a pipeline, uh, uh, to careers or college, uh, there was some sort of transition. There was some conversation about that. And then we were talking about uh, possible trades, those who don't go to college. But, but as I think about, even as I'm trying to think this through and I'm thinking about different projects, I mean, I, I just see if there's possibly any sort of funding and I get it. I mean, landlords probably right now are in no position to, to uh, uh, dish out uh, you know, I'm not pretending that there's any sort of, you know, uh, uh, you know, bucket of gold coins anywhere for them to dish out right now, especially after all of this. But if there's any way that, you know, this can be a double whammy where they're protecting their tenants from the next disaster at the same time while we're using some sort of an apprentice program or, or getting uh, people to work as well in the trades. I don't know. And there's FEMA money involved. You know what I mean? I mean, yeah, we do. I think I actually think that's that, I would love to be able to figure out what kind of program we can do so that we can get low income families into safer structures and potentially prevent families from being displaced or, or worse yet being homeless. So anyway, yeah, I, so I think that's a good that idea. There. We'll take that into into account. And just coincidentally, I got my house retrofitted recently and, and it was a, the, the, the gentleman who did it was a, 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 a first generation uh, entrepreneur who realized he had a great niche and he was able to employ uh, uh, quite a few folks and create a startup that way. So there is there is a business opportunity here for people on the retrofit side that fits with trades, people with wanting to start up small businesses. We'll look, we've got a lot of work to do, but I think that's a yeah. great suggestion and we'll take that into account as we develop the program. Yeah, and thank you. And, and again, it's just, uh, I just want to put a bug in your ear um, because um, I, I know that there's a lot of our families and they're very low income families that actually live in those uh uh, you know, and 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 I'm gonna leave it at that. Except uh, the last the last piece, Mayor, that I'm just going to put a plug in is going to be, of course, for our art community. You've heard it now from different advocates. A lot of the folks that came in, I just want to thank them for calling in and and advocating for themselves. These are small business owners. They're entrepreneurs. They're they're really struggling as well. Uh, I've I've heard them loud and clear as uh, the liaison to the art commission. Uh, we're hearing that they're struggling. Uh, th these might be small uh, organizations or there might be just individuals who are out there uh, hanging on as well. And, and we're trying to figure out what is the best way to help them uh, 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 survive uh, you know, as, as we're also uh, crafting out this road to recovery. So let's not forget about them and, uh, and, and figure out what's the best way for, for our 
our wonderful art community to be part of this, uh, this uh, road to recovery and, and road to resilience as well. That's it for me. Thank you, Councilmember. And I agree uh, with all those points, particularly the uh, the last one. That's uh, what hopefully Sensei Abierto will get us toward. It's just really uh, enabling um, our arts organizations and artists to be out there, shepherding us into a, a better future. Because uh, we're gonna we're gonna need to have to encourage people to come back out. I know it's not gonna happen. All by itself. There's a lot of fear we know, and, and when it's safe, we want to encourage folks to do so. Okay, so um, we now have a motion from Vice Mayor. Uh, unless there's any other comment, we'll vote on that motion. Menes? Yes. Morales? Aye. Owen? Owen? I'll come back. Uh, I said aye. I could make oh. Thank you. Crosco? Aye. Davis? Aye. Esparza? Yes. So, so when you get your. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Licardo? Aye. Thank you, everyone, for your support. Um, We'll move on now to item uh, 3.4, which is the review of the retirement plans, pension, and OPEB actuarial valuations. And I believe Roberto is here. Welcome, Roberto. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Uh, good evening, everyone. So I'll try to uh, try to be uh, uh, quick and to the point. Uh, we have a very short presentation. Um, this evening and is about the uh, results of the actual evaluations for both the plans. So in slide two, um, you can see the funded status for the police and fire on the market value basis is about 70.7%. And for federated, uh, just a tap of a 50%. Uh, and the unfunded liability for um, police and fire about $1.5 billion and $2.2 billion for federated. So when you combine both of the pension plans, uh, the combined funding ratio is about 61% and the total unfunded actual liability, as you can see, 3.7. Uh, on the right-hand side, you can see the OPEP numbers, about 41% funded status and about $727 million on unfunded liability. Uh, that again is on a market value uh, basis. Uh, if we go to uh, slide number two, uh, this is specifically has to deal with the contributions that are due by the city based on the evaluation result for the upcoming fiscal year 21-22 that you have been discussing uh, this afternoon. So I'll just get right to the point on the right-hand side, you can see the total amount of contributions it's about $471 million, of which about 423 is for the pension plans and about $48 million for the healthcare, also known as the uh, OPED, uh, all the post-employment benefits. Um, I just wanna uh, note uh, the description for the city contributions here. It reads amounts throughout the fiscal year. So the $471 million assume contributions will be made by the city throughout the year. As you probably know, most of you, the city does elect uh, at times to pre-fund most, if not all of the tier one contributions. And uh, if the city does elect to make the pre-funding contribution uh, for tier one right on July 1st, uh, the the seat the the boards actually offer uh, a discount to the uh, assumed rate of return by receiving the funds uh, up front on the year so that we can uh, deploy them in the in the uh, stock market and if that's the case then that will result in some savings uh, to the city um, the specific savings, obviously, I think uh, your budget director, uh, Jim Shannon, will have a better idea, but in prior communication with him, he shared with me that the, um, uh, the estimated 
benefits uh, or savings to the general fund is in the round of $12 million. Yeah, as, as I go to the presentation, if you have any questions, please do let me know. So the next slide have to do with uh, the, um, uh, the specifics of what are the components for the contributions that I do. Uh, I think the, the borderline here is, again, this is split between, uh, this is a specifically for the pension, and it deals with both the plans separately, the police and fire federated. I think the, 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 the message here is that the bulk of the contribution from the city uh, that is due, it, it deals with tier one. And, and on top of that, the bulk of that payment actually accounts for the paying for the unfunded actuarial liability. You can see that for police and fire, that amount uh, includes uh, $148.5 million and for federated $160.7 million. That's just to pay for the unfunded actuarial liability. Um, for tier two, the amounts are a lot smaller, about 14.3 million for police and fire and $17.5 million uh, for federal employees. Uh, if we can go to a slide, uh, for what I wanted to um, share with you here is um, this slide actually shows conceptually uh, when we talk about actuaria value of assets is what we call the smoothing process. Uh, you may recall that every year that I come before you, uh, I explain that on an actuarial basis, we use what, you know, what is known as a smooth process, which means that we smooth out the returns of the plans over a five year span. And so what you have before you is just uh, uh, the mathematical equation and how we arrive to that information. I think the, the story here that I want to leave you with is uh, conceptually how it works is that we account for 20% of the actual return for the last, for each year, for the last five, uh, five years. So for example, 2020, uh, the, the way you make the 100% is accounting 20% for the 2016 year, 20% uh, for 17 and so on and so forth. And so I, I think the, the story here, if you, if you can notice on the police and fire, uh, the deferred amount of 149,925,000, that is the amount of deferred losses that we have yet to recognize. And for federated, that number is actually 93,452,000. And, and I just also want to explain that when I refer to deferred losses, um, it doesn't really mean that the pension plan actually lost money. It's just a description. Uh, whenever the plans do not achieve the assumed return, any return below was expected, in this spreadsheet is, is, actually not, is actually viewed as a loss. So again, um, that means that for the next five years, uh, regardless of whatever gains or losses we may have in the future, we still have to recognize $149 million for the police and fire pension and about $93.5 million for the federated uh, pension plan. And uh, if we can go to uh, our next slide, um, which is really uh, the, the main issue I wanted to leave you with, these are the projected annual city contributions for the next 20 years. Uh, and a, a big caution here is that these projected uh, city contributions assume that all the assumptions that, that we have are met. Uh, the most noteworthy of those assumptions is assuming that the plans will at least earn the 6.625% assumed rate return. So as you can see, uh, for the city contributions, the, assuming that we meet all the assumptions going forward, contributions are expected to continue going up uh, until the year 2029 from about $471 million today to about $549 million in 2029. And then from that point forward in 2030, again, assuming all the assumptions are met, uh, they are expected to start going down uh, from uh, $546 million 
to about you know three hundred eighty one million dollars in two thousand and forty. Um, that, in a nutshell, uh, Mayor and Council Members, is your presentation. I think the goal here was to leave you with a couple of thoughts. Uh, what are the funding ratios? What is the amount of the unfunded liability? Uh, what are the city contributions for you uh, coming fiscal year 21-22 that you have been discussing this afternoon? And kind of leave you with a sense of to what are the projected city contributions for the next uh, 20 years or so. Uh, and with that, uh, I'm happy to uh, answer any questions. Thank you, Roberto. Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, let's go to comments from the public first. Uh, Blair Beekman. Uh all right, thank you, Larry Beekman here. Um, yeah, I think I've described a few times, um, you know, a, a few uh, retirement meetings I've attended. Uh, there was a really interesting lecture over the summer, I guess, or over, over the fall, or winter and fall, uh, who spoke of, uh, you know, we're trying to plan for uh, COLA and uh, for the next few years and what to expect in inflation for this year and for the next few years. And, you know, he really felt that for this year, there may not be a certain inflationary consideration to worry about. And um, it was starting in 2022 that, that the serious questions of inflation would, would return again. And I just thought it was a really interesting lecture and always uh, of interest to bring up here in public comment. I don't know what, I mean, we're dealing with issues of, uh, you know, hazard pay and, and food prices and, you know, they're real serious issues in 2022. And, and I hope we're, we can address them together. And there's, there can be collective ways to do that, I'm, I'm hopeful about. Um, in describing this item that, uh, you know, a 20 year span of things, it's interesting. I know that I've also been learning that the city of uh, San Jose is possibly going to be, uh, you know, wanting to uh, offer more uh, bond use. They want to uh, invest more in bond use. Um, good luck in how that works. Uh, I think it's an interesting notion. I don't know how that will help uh, with this situation where it can, if it can help with your, your certain deficit questions here. Um, but it, it's very slow meandering pace that I like and, and I, good luck in these efforts. Thank you. Thank you. All right, back to the council. That's our Mayhem. Thanks, Mayor. Hi, Roberto. Good to see you. Good to see you uh, too. Uh, Councilor Mayhan. Thank you. Um, I noticed in your memo, there was a bullet point in there that um, referenced the measure F cap and said that the city has decided to not exercise the cap. So we're essentially paying more in, uh, not a huge amount, I think it was $900,000, which I can uh, guess as to, to why, I assume we're trying to just pay down uh, those liabilities faster, get the money into investments earlier. But is, is that correct? And can you just tell us a little more about the strategy there? Yes, uh, so uh, in, in terms of the strategy, I'm assuming you're, you're referring to uh, of the city to make the payment, I have to defer to the city staff, but you are correct. And uh, I did kind of go quickly over that, but it's slide number three, uh, having to do if we can, if it can show the slide number three on the city contributions, you're referring to the, uh, the healthcare, uh, that is the amount, uh, slide number three, so it's the amount that reads $28.3 million for the, uh, um, for the, um, I believe is, if we can go to slide three, the cap is actually 11%. Thank you, thank you, Benji. So if you see the police and fire for 21, 22, uh, the OPEB is 28.3, the, the, the cap, uh, which it was uh, a deal between the unions and the city puts uh, the cap at 11% of total payroll, that is 27.3, so you are correct, it's $900,000. And the city did share with us their decision that they were going to pay the full amount, uh, which is 28.3, about 900,000 with the cap. Um, again, I think you are correct. I assume that the rationale behind it is number one, it wasn't a huge difference. And number two, obviously, 
Uh, ideally, the more you pay your front, the less you have to, the less costly going to be in the future. But as to the actual rationale behind that, again, I'll defer to the city for that. Uh, yeah, hi, this is Jim, Jim Shannon, city's budget director. You had it right, Roberto, as we were looking at that and, you know, plugging that into the, the base budget. You know, we are, um, you know, want to continue to make progress on what the city needs to contribute to, to you know, make sure we fund to the extent that we, that we should be. So um, I think, in, you know, prior to the um, past of the ballot measure, you know, there was a time where, where, you know, we weren't able to kind of fund all of that amount. So given the small difference, it made the most sense just to full fund the full uh, portion. Got it. So we're, kept, we're trying to catch up, basically. Okay, thanks. Um, and then, uh, Roberto, on slide five, the deferred uh, or unrealized um, losses at this point. So it looks to me like we're looking at a couple of years in a row here, actually three on the bottom chart of pretty substantial uh, deferred losses. Um, at what point should we be concerned that our projections are simply not realistic? Um, that's a very good question. So uh, again, I think the rationale behind it, uh, Councilman Mahan, is that the board looks at it in a very long-term approach. And, you know, I would argue that five years is a very short time frame on a, on a 20, 30 year uh, long-term view. Uh, having said that, uh, both plans uh, have been in the forefront in California on decreasing the assumed rate of return. So they have been decreasing uh, the assumed rate of return. Uh, and in fact, it's uh, one of the handful of plans in the state that is uh, below the six and three quarters. So they're both now at six and five A or 6.625. So we feel it's a reasonable assumption and again, the, uh, again, the, the big number here was 2016, where the actual return was an actual loss. But in 19 and 20, uh, we did have positive returns. They just did not match the assumed rate return. But uh, on the plus side, right? I mean, we're looking at it here, uh, failing to meet that that threshold. Um, we don't have the actual returns for the 2021 actuarial year because obviously we still have about three and a half more months to go. But I did want to share with the council that the uh, rate of return for the plans for the calendar year 2020 was about 16% for federated and about 13.8 for police and fire. So um, I think ideally, we know we're never gonna hit it right on the nose, but I, I think what we expect uh, on average is that some years we're gonna be over and some years we're gonna be below, so. Sure. Sure. No, that, yeah. Okay. And then finally, um, actually second to last comment. So on the final slide, I'm just curious how often you are updating that projection. Is that an annual update? Yes, it, it is another good question. It is an annual update because we obviously this assume the assumptions are met. And so every year that we do the evaluation, we account for the fact that a particular assumption have not been met. Uh, for example, in 2021, or 2020 evaluation, we did not meet the assumed rate of return, right? So that that changes the numbers. Uh, but you are correct. This this changes um, these projections are done on the annual basis, uh, and this is actually presented to the both boards uh, annually. In addition to that, we prepare a five year projection for the city. Uh, that they use uh, when they work uh, their budget numbers uh, for the coming year and years after that. So we do prepare two, uh, two reports. Again, this is one that goes to the boards uh, on the annual basis. The second one that goes uh, to the city and presumably is shared with the city council is a five-year uh, projection of contributions. Okay, thanks. And then I guess just final comment is, is I guess, just more a little bit of feedback and we can we can chat more offline. I, I you know, maybe this is a, a crazy uh, aspiration, but I, I would love for um, our residents to be able to read the memo that, that you submitted and get a, a little more sense of kind of how we're doing, you know, and to maybe figure out how to make that a little more transparent to them. I think it's a little hard to parse what's going on and whether or not it's good or bad, or we, we need to do better, or it's just the interpretive piece is, is difficult and the numbers can be a little overwhelming. So 
um, you know, I'd welcome any thoughts you have on how we can make that a little easier for people to kind of understand the, how they should analyze it. And, you know, again, happy to chat more offline, but that was just the only other thing that kind of struck me as I was reading the memo and trying to make sense of it for myself. And I think as much as possible, it would be great if, um, you know, we could make that something that would be consumable for, for the public as well. So I'll just, I'll leave it at that, but I, I appreciate all the data. And actually, I really, I thought the slide deck was really helpful. So thank you. Thank you for the walkthrough. And thank you for the input that we'll be uh, uh, discussing offline and, and work on your comments. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, other questions? <clears throat> I just had two, Roberto, and, and both of them, I, I guess, are the kinds of things that can drive budget directors to drink, but um, with no, no, no offense to Jim, but I know these are the kinds of things that worry me. I, I'm looking at page three of the, of the memo that your staff put together, um, not on the slides, but just the memo, and it describes the OPEB unfunded liability increasing and both police and fire and federated. And, uh, you know, we went through negotiations and Dave and everybody, Jennifer, everybody was involved in these knows too well for a year to get to a place where we were closing the OPEB plan uh, for retirees, which was a great triumph for fiscal sustainability, I think, in this city. And I assumed that we'd never see that unfunded liability increase <laughs> because we closed the plan. Is 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 that all attributable just to market losses? What what's going on uh, with that? That's a good question, Mayor. I I'm going to check on that, but my recollection is not really about market losses as much as it is actual experience um, oh. on on the uh, on the premiums. So I'm going to check on that, uh, but I believe that was the, the reason behind it. But uh, I, I certainly, um, I don't have the answer for you right now, so I'm going to have to okay. check and get back to, to the. Okay, so people either live in longer or the medical premiums are increasing faster than we expected or something. Y yes, this has to do with the actual experience on the, on the medical cost. That is correct. Yeah, okay. And, and then the second question I have, um, Again, sorry to get depressing, but back to the, I think uh, Councilman Mahan asked really good questions about that five-year smoothing chart uh, that you showed. <clears throat> if we could turn to that, there it is. Yeah, that's it. Um, and, you know, just looking at the, the federator for a moment, that, that four out of the five years we had actuarial losses and we didn't meet our rate of returns. And I know obviously in the most recent year, um, you know, in the last three months, we hit a pretty hard um, wall with the pandemic in 2020. I assume that's fiscal year 2020, right? Yeah, okay. uh, kind of in the year 2020, the race that I share, yes. Oh, I'm sorry. The, the years we're looking at are that the 2020. No, the, this year, these years are, I'm sorry, Mayor, this year is actually a fiscal year. Yes. So this fiscal is year. 30th. Yeah. Got it. Okay, so it reflects the three months of of all the awful things that happened in the economy. <clears throat> and I, I recognize that the asset allocation has changed considerably since 2016, obviously getting a CIO on board and there have been a lot of improvements. But I do have to admit, I'm, I'm starting to wonder, <laughs> um, you know, we're, we're rolling up this, this rock up a hill and, and maybe we just need to keep ratcheting down those discount rates. Um, and, and, you know, I, I appreciate we're going to see happier news, we hope, um, assuming the market doesn't collapse between now and June 30th of this year. Um, but does this give you as much concern as it gives me? <laughs> because, you know, for the most part, this was a, a boom time in the economy until the last three months of the 2020 fiscal year. And we just don't seem to be getting ahead. Yeah, it is a challenge, as you know, Mr. Mayor, and 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 you have heard uh, our CIO Prabhu and I come before your council over the years, and and so one of the challenges, I think, the numbers that you see in here, um, you may recall the council always asked, how come we're not taking as much risk as our peers across the uh, across the uh, the state, and uh, and so I think part of the 
part of the story of these numbers is the fact that both plans, but especially federated, uh, had uh, an allocation that took uh, less risk than our peers. So when they were making uh, or earning some returns, our returns uh, were not as high. And so I think the, it, what we tried to explain to the city council, and, and this is one of the, um, over the years I had tried to make this, pre this presentation a little more consensus. I used to bring before you the slide that dealt with uh, the sensitivity of the volatility of the investment market yeah. with the plans because both plans are so mature. And right. so because both plans are so mature and the sensitivity to the volatility is so high, we then do less risk. But we always mention that we were hoping to place the plans in a position where when there was a downturn, we can take advantage of it. So that, that happened in March and the boards actually acted quickly. And so um, we are now about the same level or a bit higher level, but not much than some of our peers. And that's why I think you'll see the returns now as the market has gone up for both plans to be in the top decile of the plans. Uh, but but again, in summary, to answer your questions on these five years, I think what you see there is the plans, the boards trying to walk a fine line uh, and making sure that they had an asset allocation that uh, will try to lose less money in downturns, even though they didn't make as much money in the up in the upswing because of the sensitivity of the plans to volatility in the market. All right. Thank you, Roberta. I look forward to seeing us in the top these decile. It's going to be great. <laughs> we, we hope that we can stay there for, the, for a little while, so we will try our best. But I, I right. no promise it. Yep, understood. Thank you. All right, any other questions? I, was there a motion? Sure, move uh, to accept. Second. Me, right. Mayor? Yes, Roberta. Before you do the vote, I, I wanted to uh, staff just texting me. God bless them. They're still engaged. And the main reason for the decrease in the OPEP uh, was the decrease, uh, just as we decreased the assumed real return on pension from six and three quarters to six and 0.625, we did the same for uh, the OPEP and decreased the discount rate from six and a half to six and a quarter. So uh, okay. as you recall, decreasing the assumed real return increases the yeah. liability and keep the case for both. So that was the main okay. reason for it. That's uh, that's a good reason. Uh, thank you. It's uh, much more heartening. <laughs> thank you. All right, let's vote on the motion. Jimenez? Yes. Corrales? Corrales? Sorry, yes. Cohen? Cohen? Carrasco? Aye. Davis? Aye. Esparza? Esparza? Arenas? Arenas? This is Esparza, yes. yes. Thank oh, you. Yes. Thank you, Foley. Uh, Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Licardo? Aye. Going back to the only one I didn't get, and that's Cohen. Hi, your mic's not always working. I thought I said it. We got you now. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Roberto. All right. Thank you. Good uh, evening. We're, we're now on to, we'll skip 3.5 because we've already heard that item. Uh, so we'll go on to 4.1, which is the audit police staffing expenditures and workload, which was scheduled not to be heard before 4 p.m. And boy, did we satisfy that. Uh, Joe is back with us. Thank you, Joe. Good evening, Joe Royce, City Auditor. I'm joined by Katanjali Mandrakar, Brittany Harvey, and Marisa Lynn from my office. And we're here to present our audit, police staffing expenditures and workload. Staffing reductions have impacted response times and led to high overtime costs. The objective of this audit was to review and compare police department staffing, spending, and overtime, or staffing, spending, and calls for service over time, including the allocation of staff by bureau uh, or division, vacancies, and use of overtime. The vice mayor originally requested this audit as an audit of police staffing, and after the protests surrounding George Floyd's death in Minneapolis, the mayor, vice mayor, and two council members requested 
us to expand the audit to include expenditures and workload, including an analysis of police calls for service, budgetary allocations, and progress towards civilianization. As the city continues its discussions around police reform and reimagining public safety, we hope this can be a resource to provide insight into the department's has staffing history, expenditures, and workload. In particular, the breakdown of calls by different priorities, which we will discuss later, can help frame policy decisions that will be discussed during the reimagining public safety conversation around when it is necessary for a sworn officer to respond to an incident and when it could be appropriate for a civilian. Police department has four core services, respond to calls for service and patrol support, investigative services, crime prevention and community education, and regulatory services. The department is organized into four bureaus, the field, Bureau of Field Operations, Investigations, Administration and Technical Services, and the Office of the Executive Officer. Staff is further broken down into specialized units and divisions. Police Department has 1,715 budgeted sworn and civilian staff and roughly two thirds are sworn staff. And the majority of those are in the Bureau, Bureau of Field Operations, primarily patrol where there's nearly 700 officers. Patrol, uh, patrol staff are divided into four divisions across the city which are further broken down into 16 patrol districts and 83 individual beats. Bureau Investigations which investigates sexual assaults, homicide, family violence and, violence and other crimes has about 160 budgeted positions. Civilian staff include fiscal and information technology staff, crime prevention analysts, communication staff, and 68 community service officers who support patrol operations. Nearly two thirds of all staff are directly related to field operations and support patrol staff in responding to calls for service. The budget in fiscal year 2020-2021 totaled $471.5 million. Our first finding is that reductions in sworn staffing over 20 years presents challenges for the department. In fiscal year 2000, 2001, the department was budgeted for 1,358 sworn staff. And as noted earlier, budget staff currently are around 1,150 or, or nearly 200 fewer than 20 years ago. In 2006, the department prepared a five year staffing plan that proposed growing the department by adding nearly 500 officers with a goal of more than 1,800 by 2012. In 2008, the economy and the city's budget crashed and rather than growing to 1,800 sworn staffing declined to 1,085. The department also saw a wave of retirements and resignations beginning in 2011 and continuing in subsequent years. And as a result, the number of active sworn officers hit a low in 2017, when in addition to the decline in budget positions, there were near over 200 vacancies. The department has increased its recruiting efforts in recent years and been able to increase sworn staffing However, we have a much less experienced department than we had in the past, with 35% of sworn staff having less than five years of experience. One thing that's important to note in this finding is that there have been a number of studies, the 2006 staffing plan that I mentioned, there's been a couple of different consultant reports that provided staffing recommendations. There was a fiscal year 2019-20 MBA, which outlined the department's staffing needs across different bureaus and ranks. What's been common with these is that budgetary limitations as is have constrain the department's ability to fulfill those plans. Our second finding is that increases in department expenditures have out, outweighed staffing changes. Despite having fewer staff, the department's budget has grown significantly the past 20 years, even adjusted for inflation. The department's budget currently accounts for 30% of the city general fund. The largest increase in expenditures has been in retirement and fridge benefit costs growing from $65 million in fiscal year 2008-2009 to $168 million in fiscal year 1920. Retirement costs alone grew from $45 million to $127 million over those years. And as Roberto showed in the previous presentation, costs are expected to remain high for the foreseeable future. Overtime costs have grown 300% over the past decade from $10.6 million to $47 million this past year. We'll discuss overtime in a little bit, in more detail in a bit. Overall, personal services, including salaries, overtime, retirement, and other benefits, accounted for 92% of overall department expenditures in fiscal year 1920. Non-personal and other expenditures totaled $36 million, and significant expenditures in that category included $10.6 million for vehicle maintenance replacement costs, $7 million for professional and consulting services, which included payments to Santa Clara County for the crime related to the crime lab and costs associated with body-worn cameras. 3.7 million for computer and telecommunication expenses and 3.8 million for police supplies and materials. 
The third finding is that the department's workload has increased as it struggled to meet its, its response time goals. Last year, SJPD received 1.2 emergency and non-emergency calls. This included about 600 emergency calls, 500,000 or 600,000 emergency calls, I apologize, 500,000 non-emergency calls, and 134,000 field events, including officer-initiated events. Some calls do not require a response by a sworn SJPD officer. For example, some non-emergency calls can be handled by non-sworn staff. Calls requiring fire or medical response are transferred to fire communications. In other instances, a call may be transferred to another organization, such as the California Highway Patrol. There also may be multiple calls for a single event. As a result, in total, officers responded to about 331,000 incidents in fiscal year 1920. Incidents are responded to based on a priority system, priority one being the highest priority, meaning immediate danger, to priority four, meaning no present or potential danger. Priority five and six responses are officer-initiated activities, such as a car or pedestrian stop, or events where an officer reviews a crime is in process. Overall, the number of police responses to calls has grown from a decade ago from around 300,000 to last year's 331,000. The department sets response time targets for its highest priority calls, priority one and priority two calls. Priority one calls indicate present or imminent danger to life for their its major damage to or loss of property. Priority two calls indicate injury or property damage, the potential for either to, to occur or the suspect is still present in the area. The department has not been able to meet its response time targets for these calls for many years. Priority one response time target is six minutes, and the department met that target just 58% of the time in fiscal year 1920, and the average response time was seven minutes. Priority two response target is 11 minutes, and the department met that target less than half the time. The average response was 21 minutes. I do want to note on this slide that uh, an improvement, it, it shows a slight improvement in response times from fiscal year 1718 to fiscal year 1819. The improvement actually reflects a change in methodology in the calculation rather than an actual improvement. The department also breaks down response times into three segments, processing time, queuing, and drive time. The department did not meet its goals for queuing and drive time for either priority one or two calls. It is most apparent for priority two calls, the queuing time Goal for priority two calls is less than three and a half minutes, but the actual average queuing time was over 10 and a half minutes. Queuing time reflects the amount of time a call waits for an officer to dispatch, and the long queuing time may signify that officers are not immediately available at the time of the call. And this is despite dispatchers being able to pull officers from other police districts to respond to calls. Additional sworn staff and patrol may alleviate this and help the department meet its response time targets, and we do have a recommendation about that budget allowing. Our fourth finding is reorganizing San Jose's patrol districts and reviewing shift schedules could optimize workload and available staffing. The department deploys patrol staff across three shifts in 16 patrol districts. The district boundaries have not changed since 1999, and the shift schedules have remained the same since the early 2000s. Past studies by outside consultants in 2010 and 2017 have made recommendations to review and modify these to achieve efficiencies in how patrol officers are deployed across the city. As you can see on the map, on the slide, which shows priority one, four responses across districts, there's great variation in the number of, call, number of calls by district and redistricting can be a way to balance out the workload. The department was allocated funding in last year's budget to begin analyzing police districts as part of a redistricting plan, but that has not yet begun. Changing shift schedules has also been recommended by past consultants better to align staffing to when calls occur most. For example, a 2017 study recommended adjusting the day and swing shift schedules to have more, more overlap during hours when there are the greatest number of calls. We recommend additional analysis here and a report back to the city council on alternative shift schedules. In addition, we have recommendations for finding to address different workload factors or council and department priorities. Additional data in some areas may help determine how best to respond or coordinate responses with other departments or agencies. As such, we recommend tracking different types of incidents, such as individuals experiencing homelessness or calls related to individuals experiencing homelessness, which could benefit from additional coordination or potentially have an alternative response. Moreover, community policing has been a stated priority for the city in past years. However, the department has not, does not have an updated strategy on how to make this a reality. For example, a large majority of community policing has been done through foot patrol. However, foot patrol has been funded each year on a one-time basis since 2014. And of course, you guys were all discussing that a little earlier. 
So we also recommend the city identify ongoing funding for priority foot patrol positions and developing a community policing strategy. Again, both of which have been department and council priorities. Our fifth finding is that the department has relied on overtime to staff the department. Reductions in staffing, vacancies in the department, and an increased workload have contributed to an increased reliance on overtime. However, while the number of vacancies has decreased in recent years, overtime has not declined at the same rate. Over the past decade, overtime hours used has grown from less than 200,000 hours to more than 450,000 hours, and costs have grown from under $11 million to $47 million, and now accounts for 10% of all department spending. I do want to clarify one point on the overtime this past year. The, the civil unrest and the overtime associated with that was a, a, a large contributing factor to the growth in fiscal year 1920. However, we looked at the overtime usage up through mid-May, and overtime usage was actually trending up from 2018-19. It was below the 17-18 highs, but we were not seeing that same decline. So it, it, it raised some concerns for us. We also note that use of overtime among some staff is excessive. The duty manual restricts the amount of time an individual should work in any given 24-hour period to 16 hours. What we saw was 181 incidents where an officer worked more than 16 hours of overtime in a 24-hour period. And there were 60 individuals who worked more than 1,000 hours of overtime during the year. We've noted in past audits the risks associated with fatigue, including our 2016 audit of police overtime and our 2012 audit of the secondary employment program continue to be concerned. So the department categorizes overtime in two overarching types, mandatory overtime, which includes such activities as court appearances, late calls for service or arrests, overtime to meet minimum staffing requirements, or as defined in the duty manual or when deemed necessary by the department. Discretionary overtime includes activities which are not immediately necessary for providing police services to the community. This has historically included completion of reports at the end of shift, administrative work and training, a 2017 general order specifically states that no discretionary overtime will be approved except under extenuating circumstances and must be approved by a captain or higher. But despite that order, some overtime historically deemed discretionary and expected to be completed on regular time has increased at a greater rate than mandatory overtime. We also are not always seeing documented approval by a captain or higher. And according to the department, some of this relates to the level of experience of staff that I described earlier, for example, less staff or less experienced staff may take longer to complete report writing than a more experienced officer. Finally, employees can earn compensatory time or comp time instead of pay for some overtime duties. While the department has noted comp time provides flexibility since it typically does not immediately affect the department budget, we have seen this change in recent years. Officers can accrue up to 400 hours, 400, I'm sorry, 480 hours of comp time under the Fair Labor Standards Act or FLSA. Any overtime worked beyond this limit is paid out of the next paycheck. Last year, more than $16 million was paid out in overtime to individuals who had reached the 480 limit. That is, the overtime would have been for comp time, not for reaching the limit. And as you can see, that amount has been growing in recent years. In November 2020, there were 449 officers who had reached the 480 limit, and the associated comp time liability has reached $21 million. So we have several recommendations in these areas, including enforcing limits on overtime hours, reassessing which types of overtime should be considered mandatory and discretionary, including when follow-up and report writing should be conducted on overtime, developing guidelines around captain approvals for discretionary overtime and working to reduce comp time balances. Our last finding is that additional opportunities exist to to, for civilianization to address sworn workload. Civilianization enables a police organization to focus sworn staffing on sworn duties by hiring civilians to assist with the department's workload. With an increasing workload, limited sworn staffing and budgetary constraints, the department may benefit from expanding its use of civilians to response to incidents. The department's established, the department established a community service officer program or CSO program in 2014. CSOs respond to calls during the day and swing shifts and are assigned calls in which a suspect is not present and do not pose an immediate safety risk, such as abandoned vehicles and burglary reports. There are currently 68 budgeted CSO positions, and in fiscal year 1920, CSOs responded to about 22,000 CSOs responded to about 60% of all call types identified in the duty manual as calls mm. which were able to respond. Many of the remaining calls were addressed by sworn staff, indicating there may be room for future growth of the CSO program, which would allow 
could allow uh, sworn officers to focus their efforts on a higher priority one, two, and two calls and provide an alternative response to some calls. The workload for CSOs also varies significantly across districts, which may result in inequitable workload for CSOs, uh, which are generally assigned one per district. Finally, we also know that CSOs respond to calls outside those specifically identified in the duty manual and are not consistently involved in community policing. So we have a couple of recommendations in this area, including adding more CSOs, as funding allows to free up patrol officers and provide additional non-sworn capacity to respond to calls, developing guidelines to more equitably distribute CSO workload across districts, reassessing the types of calls CSOs can respond to and updating the duty panel accordingly. So our audit includes 10 recommendations. And as described earlier, much of this audit provides broad context for where the department is today and how we got here as well as the budgetary constraints under which the department operates. And hopefully this information in this report can be a resource as the city moves into the next stage of its reimagining public safety conversations. We'd like to thank the police department, the city manager's office, the budget office, and the city attorney's office for their time and insight. The administration's response is including the yellow pages in the report. I ask that you accept the report and I'll turn it over to the police department for the administration's response. Thanks, Joe. Good evening, Mayor, City Council. Uh, Dave Tindall, Acting Welcome. Chief of Police. Thank you. Uh, Dave Tindall, Acting uh, Chief of Police, joined by uh, now Chief of Police Tony Mata, uh, Lisa Perez, Chief Administrative Officer, and uh, Steve Donahue, Lieutenant of Research and Development. I'd like to begin tonight by uh, first thanking our city auditor and the staff for conducting this audit of our department staffing, expenditures, and workload, and the impact of staffing reductions a pattern response times and overall cost within our city. Overall, the department agrees with the audit recommendations, acknowledging more work needs to be done. The San Jose Police Department is the most thinly staffed agency of any large city in the nation. We received over 1.2 million emergency and non-emergency calls annually. While we will discuss and concede the overtime levels must be brought to balance, we also believe more work needs to be done to dive deeper into our staffing levels to determine the optimum level for a city of our size. We look forward to developing a long-term strategy to restoring staffing in both sworn and civilian ranks as budget allows. We will work to implement a community policing strategy that meets the community demands and council priorities utilizing an internal work group. The department will assess priority community policing needs using an equity focused process in consideration of high needs areas. This will be in conjunction with community outreach and engagement efforts. We will continue to work on reimagining community safety, both under the city's police reforms plan and our own internal work groups. The reimagining community safety work is intended to evaluate and recommend new ways in which the department intervenes with social issues and reduces social conflicts that are non-criminal in nature. This includes alternatives for response to calls for service and calls that may be shifted to other work groups or civilian employees. The outcomes from this work will be folded into the department's approach to implementing these audit recommendations as appropriate. Regarding overtime, the health and welfare of our staff is a priority for this department. Unfortunately, in order to try and meet service demands, the department has relied heavily on overtime. As staffing reaches authorized levels, and more officers are street ready, we expect that overtime needs to drop. We have already moved towards a working group made of various ranks, fiscal personnel, and other civilian staff to focus on our overtime issues. This group will focus on how overtime is being used, review its overtime policies in consideration of the current staffing issues, and develop a plan that considers policy changes, clarification of policies, consistent messaging, training for staff, enforcement of policies, and supervisory and management review. We will collaborate with OER to seek changes to the MOA with the San Jose Police Officers Association to provide additional discretion and management control of comp, comp, of comp balances. With that, I will be available to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Chief Tindall. Uh, all right, we are going to go first to the community for questions and comments, and then we'll come back to the council. Uh, the person with the phone number ending 5140. Welcome. Uh, 
Hello. Can you hear Hello. me? Welcome. Yes, we Hello. can. Hello. Yeah, welcome. Yeah, yeah thank you. Yeah. Um, I think what needs to happen is there needs to be an economy that's opened up so there's money to pay for all this. And all this – I'm reading about all this overtime for everybody. You know, it's like these guys are making three hundred thousand dollars a year. God love them for being able to make this kind of money. But how are we going to be able to afford this in the future? It's not going to happen. And not only that, I mean, I'm going to just get down to brass tacks. The service isn't very good from the city of San Jose. Both police and fire. It's terrible. It's shameful, really. What what happens with people when they call nine one one? People don't show up. You get put on hold. It's awful. Uh, I've done it before in my in the and you know when there was a fire in my neighborhood, the fire department never showed up, or when they finally did, it was too late. Woman died, uh, and the, the police department. I mean, they got a terrible attitude when you call them. You know, they they treat you like uh, they're doing you a favor with their nose up in the air. Uh, I, I I'm I'm fed up with the city services. You guys need to sharpen your pencils. And what happened in June of 2016 when they stood back and allowed Trump supporters to be beaten down? That was a disgrace, and you guys know it. And you know, years later, I like the fact that San Jose PD protected the Vietnamese community that were Trump supporters, but they had to be shamed into doing so. You know, nobody happened, nothing happened to those people who were supporting Trump. Uh, and you, you could you could say what you want about him. I know everybody on that city council hates him, probably including the cops. But you guys should all be ashamed of yourself what you did four years ago. But you were somewhat redeemed when you protected the people this year. And I, but I'll never thank San Jose PD because I think you guys are a big pile of shit. Uh, you won't be speaking again tonight. Uh, Mr. Beekman? Hi. Thank you. Uh, Blair Beekman here. Um, uh, congratulations to you, uh, Deputy Mata, now becoming police chief. I hope we can very much address uh, issues and how that can become a more progressive uh, surveillance in law enforcement uh, is an issue that talks about open public policy with the surveillance process, if needed. I don't like surveillance. If it is talked about, it's open public policies that, that really can help uh, define the subject, what we're working towards, reimagine equity. And um, what was spoken here tonight, um, the ideas of overtime, the ideas of community policing, um, you know, in Berkeley and in Oakland, I mean, they're really talking about the community being a part of the process and how, how that can happen and how it can really not involve the police and how the future of staffing of police has to be considered. And uh, I know there is a great reimagined future where we can all cooperate and work together. But like I've been saying these past few weeks, it, it is a future where we're learning to lessen a reliability on the police. And that has to be a goal. That has to be an important subject matter for our future. This is, this is a learning to minimize the use of police in the future and bringing out the community itself and the health and human services and how to address our issues. So, you know, and, and, and to also quickly me uh, mention that reimagine equity, as I wanted to say before, are our better ideals. There are good persons. This isn't uh, malarkey. This is really good idealism and good stuff. Um, this is about uh, an important, peaceful future. So good luck in how we work as a community to address these issues. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Beekman. Uh, I'm going to ask the city attorney uh, if I can make a referral for further consideration. Perhaps she can return during closed session. Uh, with regard to the gentleman who just used an expletive again, I know this is a person who has used expletives in the past. I'd like to make an inquiry. Uh, perhaps we can discuss uh, closed session with regard to liability or not uh, with regard to permanent uh, ban of the speakers who insist in continuing to use uh, expletives and violate the quorum of the council. Uh, Vice Mayor Jones. Thank you, Mayor. Actually, you had one more public comment. Oh, I do. Forgive me. Someone just raised their hand. Uh, thank you. Scott Largent.
Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. Scott Largent. I uh, kind of got off the meeting earlier, so I do appreciate you guys taking my uh, my hand as I kind of just waved it up at the last minute. Um, I understand we're talking about the uh, overtime issues at the San Jose Police Department and I guess the department in general. Um, I am disappointed. Um, I was looking forward to a chief coming from outside the department. Um, I don't have bad blood with uh, uh, Chief Mata. Um, I, it just, I, I'm just very disappointed. I, I think you guys had the opportunity to really make some changes, and it, I, I just do not think it's going to happen. I think we're going to have another four or five years of some of the same, uh, the same stuff we've been dealing with, and that disconnect from the community. Um, our, our police department is not in line with our community. They do not, uh, they are just, it's just non-existent. It's, it really is not. Um, I like what people have been saying, getting on here, talking about having foot patrols even downtown and, you know, maybe we get that coffee with the cops stuff going again. And, um, you know, just, just, we've got to get on the same page. And, and there are a lot of good men and women that work at the department and I've gotten to know a lot of them. Um, I've also gotten to know a lot of people that uh, um, didn't make it up the rank and file, and and, and they should have, and uh, they were kind of pushed down, and they spoke up about bad behavior in that in the department, and they suffered. And a lot of these officers are are black; they're African American, and um, they did not make it up the ranks. And I think you guys need to start looking into that. Um, there's several news articles that will be coming out. Uh, pretty soon that are going to discuss a lot of that stuff. And um, I think we need to focus on that. So um, um, I'm going to leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, returning to Council Vice Mayor Jones. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I want to thank uh, Joe and his, his team for that audit. I originally requested the audit um, because I had a hypothesis that uh, San Jose was um, significantly understaffed uh, particularly compared to other uh, comparable cities. And um, the audit did highlight the fact that uh, we are understaffed, but also highlighted a couple of areas that I actually didn't anticipate. And, and that was that just as important is operational uh, and procedural issues uh, around uh, districts and around um, overtime and around the use of um, civilian uh, personnel. And so that was very enlightening for me and uh, it was an eye opener. And I think that this um, audit is gonna be very uh, valuable for our reimagining community safety uh, process. Uh, I have a question to um, the chief, uh, Chief Mata. Um, the, the issue around um, overtime jumped out, uh, I think to all of us. As, as a major cost uh, um, and expense. And one, one question to you is, um, is that overtime number, that $45 million factored into your overall um, police budget? Or is it an additional cost that's, that's, that's unanticipated or not as anticipated as, as the actual numbers that we're looking at? Yeah, most of it is, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, um, fact factored in. However, um, you know, we try to maintain um, or stay within uh, that that amount. So uh, the next question is, um, how transferable um, are those dollars? So say um, you have uh, that amount budgeted, and say you come in you know, well below that, that number, uh, how transferable are, the, are those dollars for other purposes, like ongoing expenses, like hiring additional um, CSOs or, or police officers? Well, we don't, that, that money just specifically for that, um, um, we, we budget for the CSOs specifically. And again, if, if other units run into overtime or any cost, then yes, we, we have to move um, money around. And uh, I can defer to um, 
our uh, chief financial officer, uh, Lisa Perez, she can provide more information on that. And then, and then uh, Chief, if you don't mind, this is Jim Shan, the, the budget director, just as Lisa's getting on. I know that the, the, um, that, that amount for over, overtime, um, the actuals is, is you know, baked into the budget, but pretty much has been absorbed by vacancy savings, which has been the reason why the overtime has been able to be higher. Um, but, you know, police you know, generally in the past has been able to remain within the budgets really due to those vacancy savings. So the, the base, you know, overtime budget for police is much lower at around 21 million. Lisa, I don't know if. Uh... Hi, yeah, this is Lisa Perez. Yeah, I, Jim, thanks for saying that. That's what I was gonna talk about is we, we are budgeted at a certain level for our overtime and we have been able to use vacancy savings um, to offset the higher expenses. When you ask if that's trans transferable to other purposes, our, our budget is set for salaries and um, we can't necessarily transfer to other expenses in the department. That would be something council would have to to do as a as a budget action. Great, thank you um, for that clarification. So um, again, uh, it was very enlightening. Um, there were a lot of again process and operational um, challenges and issues that uh, that need to be addressed. And and uh, chief. Uh, I'm looking forward to uh, tackling those those big issues. You've been appointed for what eight hours now, so uh, I expect for you to have all those issues uh, resolved by tomorrow. So, uh, good luck. Just for the record, Vice Mayor, he he starts his new role on Monday. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll start the clock on Monday then. Okay. And again, congratulations, Chief. And uh, I'd like to make a motion to accept the uh, City Auditor's report. Second. Right. <clears throat> There's a motion. Uh, Council Member Cohen. Yeah, thank you. I'm um, just going to follow up a little bit on the conversation we started before during the budget. I know um, Vice Mayor Jones already kind of talked about this topic a little bit. Um, it sounds like what's budgeted in our, in our actual budget is $21 million above staffing level for overtime. And I, I understand that um, fully benefited uh, FTE might be a little, might cost more than a, than an FTE of overtime. Although there's there's some variation in there because of um, yeah, you know because the more overtime the individual gets, the, there's different rates. I think, but but I think that it's true that it costs a little bit more. But it seems to me a better strategy to at least take a portion of that 21 million and for us as a council to budget for increasing our our base FTE and police. Um, I think that that makes more sense for a lot of reasons. It's good to have more police officers to draw from. I noticed that we're, I believe, according to the report, we're funding all 41 airport positions by overtime. It seems that there are places where we can go back to actually funding officers um, rather than relying on overtime for all those positions. It also seems that, you know, it, that the city's better served if you have rested officers working on regular hours instead of several officers that are working, you know, hundreds or thousands of hours beyond uh, their, their normal at time and, and stringing together many hours in a row, it doesn't necessarily strike me that we're serving the community as well with that kind of stretching people that, that thin. Um, so I, I think we ought to consider what's the balance. Maybe it's, it's a question for, for uh, Jim and others, what's the, what's the right balance of, of adding positions versus, um, versus spending overtime. And I think Obviously, it's not going to be a one-year fix because we might not be able to staff up that quickly in one year, but maybe over a certain number of years, assuming that we're continuing just to put $21 million above budget aside for overtime, there should be some level that we can achieve on staffing that would make our city better staffed for its size. Um, I, I also want to call attention to the, um, to the data about the districts um, and talk a little bit about the importance of redistricting. Um, I, I, you know, people forget often about the very northern end of San Jose, but District R, along with actually District L, is the most, have the most calls in the city, and it's one of the biggest geographic districts in the city as well. The result is that District R is actually in 2019-20 was the, had the longest response time of any district in the city, 
that's the district in the north part of district four so i'm really interested in figuring out how we can adjust the district in north san jose to, to um get the response time down our residents in alviso notice it talk a lot about how long it takes the response time in that area and you know while we know that many people around the city complain about response time and always assume that response time is bad the data actually bears it out that what they're seeing in alviso and what they're their, the anecdotes say is actually true. Um, if you look at the response time from the city audit that came out last month or a couple months ago, um, it was actually quite significantly longer in District R um, than, than anywhere else in the city. So anyway, I just want to um, thank the uh, auditor's office for this report. I think it's really valuable to have this data and um, we ought to really be looking at those uh, suggestions and, and, and try to take some action to, to resolve some of the things that they've, they've talked about. So thank you very much. Councilmember, do, do you mind, can I, can I take a, a shot at that overtime oh, question? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Mind? Um, so the, um, you know, so back in the day, that was a, a much closer analysis. Um, because we will, we'll always be wanting to do that analysis to see, you know, overtime versus new, new positions, you know, what makes the most sense. You know, back in the day, that was a closer call. As retirement costs have really ramped up over the past, you know, 15 years and a lot over the past 10 years, um, it's it's quite a big difference. So, um, you know, the the, the um, effective retirement uh, rate for a, a beginning officer is, is 76% of the pensionable salaries when you factor in the UAL that we were just talking about um, in the retirement session. So, you know, uh, um, the you know the the beginning pay for uh, the beginning uh, sort of total total cost for a police officer benefits. Um, and everything all included is about $220,000 when sort of all in there. If you were just to think about um, an officer that was purely funded on over, over time, so just thinking about, you know, salary and one and a half times salary as sort of a gross cal calculation, it's about 150 or so. Um, so it's, it's about a $70,000-ish cost difference. And just kind of looking, stepping back and just looking at a high, high level, we'll always do that work. But um, just because I think, you know, the, the retirement side of it really sort of drives the, the cost of an extra position quite a bit higher than just thinking about the overtime in and of itself. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. And obviously there's a mathematical exercise here, but there's also, I think, a practical exercise and a, uh, and a strategic exercise about what's the right way to, to staff a police department. I mean, you could cut the police staff, uh, staffing even lower and just have more people work overtime, but you know that I don't think anybody would argue that's the right thing for the city. So the question is, as the city continues to grow, what's the right staffing level? And now that we're fully staffed, you know, what, how much more should we fully staff in order to improve operations in the police department as well as um, balance our budget? So, you know, I, I don't think it should just be about the money, although I, I fully appreciate that, you know, the, the calculations that you were talking about. So thank you for the information. You know, can I just follow up on that discussion since you guys are on that piece and we'll go right back to the council. I just want to follow up with Jim because I know you, you'd you probably agree, Jim, that the average cost of an officer is not the same as the marginal additional cost of an officer. Uh, because we're baking in particularly tier one unfunded liability issues and we're, we're spraying them over a whole bunch of officers and saying this is the average, right? But for a new hire, that's a much lower cost in a marginal sense. Is that, is that fair to say? Um, I, you know, I think that is fair to say. So I, again, those are sort of gross calculations. Um, although, you know, when we when we put the budget together, you know, that that cost is, you know, we, we do spread that cost out to each position. So when we add a new budget right. position, that would be the cost of that budget position. Um, you know, so um, you know, there's- But no as we would add, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, please go ahead. But as you would, you would add officers, then you'd be spreading. I mean, you know, what's killing us in costs we know is, is the unfunded liability that has nothing to do with the individual who's mm -hmm. filling the seat, it has to do with you know whatever happened in the past with somebody else quite often. And so if we're expanding the, the number of workforce, then theoretically we should be spreading that unfunded cost over a larger denominator, right? Yes, yes, you would, you would. Um, hey, so, Mayor. hey Mayor. Yeah, I'm sorry. You might have I interject, I just need to dumb it down a little bit. So, yeah, okay, sure. <laughs> so, 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 Jim, say our unfunded liability is $1,000. Okay. 
and we have a thousand police officers. Do we add one additional police officer? The unfunded liability spread over 1,001 police officers is less than the unfunded liability spread over 1,000 police officers. Is it, would that be a good way to, to frame Per it? officer. Per officer. Yeah. Uh, I, I think that is, if, if you have a, um, a, a, a new officer at tier two, um, to the extent right. that maybe you're adding sergeants or higher level positions that are maybe already in tier one, um, then it would, it would be a different story because when you, um, any tier one does have UAL associated with it as part of that position. So, uh, so the, but basically I think that's a correct way to think about it. And I, I guess I, if I just want to jump in at some risk, I would say <laughs> certainly, um, you know, funding officers through overtime is, is far cheaper, but the issue of, you know, is there a point of where we added enough officers that we were able to spread those costs over a, a broader base at, you know, there's some sort of magical point there. I guess that's an interesting question, Jim, that we would have to look at, because I, if I'm understanding kind of the question that the mayor is asking in particular, but I think that's worth looking at um, in, in our analysis. Absolutely. Yeah, I appreciate you looking at it. And I know this is a conversation, I guess, Councilmember Cohen started during the budget discussion, but I think particularly now we're in this position that we hadn't been before, where we're finally getting up to our full budgeted uh, FTE count that, you know, I, I know that there are some things that we're always using overtime for, like, you know, walking beat patrol, which I know that all of us would much rather see in a happy world regular shift officers working their shift uh, because we know that's better for community police and everything else. I also think about those things that we know we're routinely using overtime for um, that are less predictable, but we know we're always gonna need overtime. For example, uh, we need pay cars after there's been a, a shooting to, you know, to get officers out into a neighborhood where we gotta calm things down and avoid risks of retribution, shootings and things like that. And, and, and I just wonder where, you know, if, if, if we knew we had a certain amount of demand for that, even if it is unpredictable, at least having officers, for example, on a TEU shift, handling traffic enforcement, who would always be called on to fill the role first. I just wonder if as we're adding these two tier two officers at a much lower marginal cost, um, if, if we couldn't do more and obviously um, ensure we have less tired officers out there doing better work. Mm -mm. And I guess if I, I, I was wondering, I'll stop there. I wonder, Joe, <laughs> did you look at that at all in the audit? So looking at the cost of the individual, you know, the, that that transferability, we we talked about it, but again, it's just the same conversation, just running into the same issues that Jim was talking about. Just uh, one thing that you just want to kind of take a, a step back is just kind of the different types of overtime being used. You know, the mayor mentions the you know, the suppression pay cars that are, you know, we, we need to use these for certain instances. Um, uh, Councilmember Cohen mentioned the airport positions. And then there's other types of overtime, you know, so there's a lot of some of this is the, the mandatory stuff, the minimum staffing. And then, you know, then looking at the discretionary stuff, which is more in the, the report writing and the training. And, the, and so we were trying to kind of paint that picture of all these different types and where do we, where do we need to put some controls so we can really put our, our get our arms around it. Um, and this is why we were really focusing on that discretionary stuff, you know, the stuff that historically has been on, on been done on regular time, and now we've been seeing growing more and more part of the overtime, and so that's why we, you know, we're really focusing on that piece where it's like we need to get get our arms around this, make sure our controls are really tight there, because that's where we were seeing the growth. Um, and to to the mayor's point, we're going to be needing overtime. I mean, the, the it's it, it's it's just the nature of of the the organization. Um, because we'll need the suppression pay cars, we'll need these other pieces. But having that longer term strategy to kind of address some of these, again, these council priorities, the foot patrol that we've talked about, or, um, you know, there's been one time funding to address. And we've, uh, you know, we note in the, in the audit where there's different times where something will come up, we'll have one time funding to uh, fund a position for sexual assault investigations, or another one for Another one that's ongoing is the, the truancy abatement suppression program, the TABS program. So we have these things that we that, that we have that we need to, to have bodies for that we're using over time. Then there's this other stuff that, you know, can we kind of get our arms around and control? So that's where we were really focusing on that. And then 
again, looking at that, the, the, the over just the general growth broadly with the hours, um, the, 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 the fatigue question, the comp time question, you know, it, our hope is that as we, as, as, as you all said, as we get, you know, more officers and we get more fully, fully staffed up, um, we can start bringing this down. As we have more experienced officers, maybe we can, you know, address these questions of, you know, getting the report writing done more uh, efficiently. So it's, it's, a, it's a long, it's, as Acting Chief Tyndall said in the response, it's, it's going to take some time to really get the full, their arms around the whole thing, because it's, it's not one thing, there's multiple things going on. So. Thanks, Joe. Can I have one more follow-up question? Okay. Um, the, the report writing, is that, is there, are there technologies that are being introduced? Is that, are they still handwritten? How is it done? How are they doing reports? I thank you for the question. Um, so in regards to the report writing, we did go to a Versatex system, um, which is a lot more robust. It gives us the ability to pull a lot more data points, uh, which we were looking. Um, as was previously mentioned, uh, we do have a young patrol staff. Um, over 50% of our patrol staff right now is probably less than three years on. Uh, and we keep on, even through the use of technology, keep on asking them to track more. Uh, we currently have a, um, a survey going on uh, with select officers of different ranks and different years of experience uh, that is going through different methods on what they do to clear a call. Um, so whether it's data points, whether it be racial profiling, whether it be use of force, uh, whether it be uh, just the report writing itself, street checks, all these different things have been added to our police officers over the years. And so we're going through right now to actually see in those data points what they're collecting and how long it takes them. So from point A to point B, they're actually timing officers of different ranks and different years so that we can better understand uh, where we may have some deficiencies that we can, uh, we can help uh, plug up. Okay, yeah, I hope we can make that process more efficient over time. Um, and one thing I will add to the report writing portion of it, and, and I know Joe said some of that is discretionary. Uh, we do have policies in place that our police officers finish their police reports. Uh, before they go home. A lot of that is for investigative purposes because of this follow-up to be done uh, by detectives the next morning. Uh, this, the report has to be written. And then likewise, when someone is arrested, uh, the, the clock starts as far as when that report needs to get to the court uh, for the purposes of arraignment. Uh, so a lot of times the police officers, if they've been working, which they often do, um, multiple, you know, going from call to call to call all night, the only time that they get to catch up with the reports is at the end of the night. And a lot of time that unfortunately results in overtime. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. And I know that, that that's common in other fields too, where you know medical people go home and spend their evenings, their, their personal time doing their charts and things. So I mean, this is not totally unusual, but obviously the more efficient we make the process, the better. I want to make one other comment about the redistricting just quickly, because you know, district district R has that large tech area in North San Jose. And you know, for example, we hear the data from the a captain in that area about how many of their calls are to the parking garages of our tech companies and to things that are not residential. So as we consider districts, it shouldn't necessarily all be based on number of residents within a district, but you know the kinds of calls and the, and the size of the district and also. And I think District R is, is somewhat unique because of the, the, the size, but also the, the density of businesses and the types of businesses and you know how spread out some of the residential areas are. So. I just want to, as we consider that redistricting, to take some of those things into account. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Customer Esparza? Um, I had to switch out. I'm having some technical issues. Um, so um, I wanted to talk about um, redistricting as well. And I think um, Henry has a map. Do you have the map, Henry? I do. I'll pull it up right now. Okay. So it's a big concern um, because my district Lincoln is completely contained within district seven. Um, according to the last annual report on city services, the police responded to approximately 21,000 incidents in district Lincoln out of 212,000 citywide. So we have 17 police districts and yet 10% of all the responses citywide are in district Lincoln. Um, and officers in District Lincoln responded to some 5,000 more incidents than the next busiest district, uh, Councilmember Cohen's District Robert. 
Um, and so I, I wanted to pull up this. This is from the city auditor's presentation, um, the annual services presentation um, to, that shows the additional um, calls for service. And you can see District R in the north. Um, thanks, uh, thanks, Henry. Um, and so I just wanted to highlight that I think redistricting is important obviously not just to level out the level of service per district because um, technically District Lincoln has the same number of officers as every other. And, um, and so those overtime cars, those suppression cars are coming into District Lincoln. Um, and so it's kind of this false sense of staffing. Um, and so I'm hoping that redistricting doesn't just help District Lincoln, but it helps sort of the whole city kind of reassess um, what, we, what we can do better. Um, and I wanted to ask Chief Tyndall, um, you know, I appreciated um, Joe's uh, report, um, but in talking about overtime and the mayor has uh, talked about this, um, about all the things that um, that we love, that we need in our communities, but are covered by overtime. And Chief Garcia was pretty good about rattling them off. Um, and so some of them stuck in my head, like the street crimes unit, prostitution detail, foot patrols, gang cars, burglary cars, all of those things are run off of overtime. What else, Chief Tyndall, is run on overtime? Thank you for the question, council member. And uh, unfortunately it'd be an exhaustive list. So if you can bear with me here for a second, I'll, I will give you the list. So uh, there's a myriad of overtime uses to include uh, budgeted items, uh, state and federal grants, and then outside entities like our water district contract. Uh, so some of those, uh, like you highlighted foot patrols, not only downtown, but in high needs areas throughout the city. Um, every division has an allotment of foot patrols. Uh, so they either get moved to hotspot areas uh, that can be an apartment complex or a shopping area like Little Saigon uh, from that standpoint. And then also a community policing areas. Uh, we have quality of life cars that go out and they deal with uh, a lot of the uh, issues revolving around graffiti. Uh, it could be RV parking. It could be uh, a number of things uh, that we uh, sometimes try to get CSOs to go to um, from the standpoint, but sometimes there's inherent risks with sending CSOs to, uh, to RVs that may be occupied when we don't know who's inside them. Uh, we've gained cars. We Let me just interrupt you right, right there. Some of the RVs, it's not just folks in an, this is crime in RVs. I, I know because I've had my share in District 7. Um, so there have been quite a few guns confiscated. And, and so it's crime in RVs. It's not just RVs. I just wanted to correct that. It's, not just, it's yeah. not just RVs that are parked. Um, right. It's RVs that we know where we're getting calls of drug use, um, drug dealing. Um, and a lot of different issues that go with it. And yes, you're absolutely correct. We've, uh, we've seized quite a few guns from those areas and from those RVs. Um, other things like Project Hope, uh, overtime cars, uh, Hoffman, Viamonte, Rotor, and Roundtable. Uh, we already mentioned gang cars, uh, community policing uh, overtime for the captains to have their community policing officers out there. And especially before COVID, that was dealing with a lot of the community policing events and the community policing meetings that we could not take uh, officers out of the beach structure for. Uh, we talked about truancy abatement, uh, guardian cars that were uh, doing protection for our schools, a cold case investigation from homicide, uh, domestic violence restraining orders, uh, human trafficking decoys, ICAC grants. Uh, we had some grant stuff from a, uh, council, uh, sorry, Kansan Chu on uh, burglaries. We've contacted completion because our, for our burglary unit uh, was staffing so low. Uh, we have to have overtime for that to uh, follow up on burglary calls. Uh, we have task forces, both the state and federal. Uh, we certainly have the water district that I'd mentioned before. Uh, we actually have city hall patrol on Mondays and Fridays for an additional officer. Uh, as this year, you know, we had fire mutual aid responses. Uh, we have airport pay cars. We have entertainment zone that'll start opening up again. Uh, we've had ICAC operations. Uh, we currently have through federal grants MCAT uh, which is our uh, justice mental health coll collaboration, uh, parent project, team kids, uh, office of violence against women over time, domestic violence operations, 
uh, OTS, which is uh, Office of Traffic Safety, DUI checkpoints, traffic enforcement, and then not to mention the overtime that we have that is unplanned. I know the mayor mentioned civil arrest. Uh, as it stands right now, even with street racing, uh, we are pulling either officers off the street, or sorry, off the uh, 911 call system to handle street racing. Or if we have people that are out, uh, sometimes we have to hold specific shifts over just to deal with the uh, mass deployment and doing that. So that's a, just a number. I know I'm to the tip of the iceberg, but uh, that is some of the uh, items that we are dealing with on an overtime basis only. Thank you. And I just I just wanted to highlight that, that overtime isn't just some random thing. It's the things that we all fight for and love. Um, and, and one of the things I, I also wanted to point out was, um, you know, unfortunately I have some, uh, you know, some gang areas along with some of my colleagues and, um, and when there is unfortunately a gang related homicide, there's a lot of work that goes out in the community, um, both from our PRNS staff but also from PD to reduce tensions. And so that's, I think, an example of, of unplanned overtime that can't be helped, although I would love to do as much as possible to prevent all of that from happening in the first place. And I think that's, um, I can't wait to have that discussion at reimagining so that we can invest more in our neighborhoods so that we have, um, so that we have less homicides um, and less gang cars um, in, the, in our future. Um, so I just wanted to highlight that um, and thank Council Member Cohen for bringing up the issue of, you know, if what is the right size for police staff for city of our size? And, and I think, you know, we should be asking that question. We should be having those conversations because um, as the auditor, you know, mentioned, um, and, and it has been brought up previously, we've, we've, never been asked to do less with more, right? We're always being asked to do more with less. And um, I just, I, I don't think that um, any of this is particularly sustainable. I thank the city auditor for his recommendations. Um, I think that's helpful, but I still think that we as a city need to have those conversations. That's it for me, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Arenas. <clears throat> thank you. Um, thank you, Joe, for, for uh, a, once again, for a great audit. And um, I'm just gonna go in and start asking some questions. I think the, the conversation has been great so far. I'm also very much interested in learning how do we hire more officers versus having uh, more done um, over over time. Um, and, and connected with that concern is also, um, which I know that this is going to um, be addressed, and I appreciate um, the police department um, supporting all of the recommendations. Um, one of the concerns is that, you know, the uh, police officers have a max of 480 or 460, I think it is 480, uh, and then begin to use um, and then begin to get paid um, after that. Um, and it's been noted by the auditor that um, vacation time is um, when they take vacation, it, it, they don't take any of the comp time. So it's maxed out, it forces or triggers that, that paid out overtime um, hours. So I know that there is a, um, a recommendation for this, and um, and I think the um, police department will enforce existing overtime rules in the interim until a new policy is developed. And the target date is June of uh, next year. Um, and so I wonder if you could, um, uh, Chief Tyndall or Chief Mata, give me some thoughts about what do we do in the interim? Um, because I, I realize that there's um, not enough officers in our city of San Jose, but I think our auditor has done a really good job of showing um, maybe the over-dependency of, of overtime in kind of everyday uh, functions. Um, certainly, I think in officer-initiated 
um, activities. And so I would like to know what, what in the interim, what are we going to do? How are we going to, um, what is the, first of all, what is that benchmark for overtime? Like what is, what would we say is, is a reasonable average to, to expect? Um, because as council member Esposa just pointed out, we want to make sure that we don't bind ourselves um, when there is these uh, emergencies and we want to make sure that we um, have as many officers available to respond. So thank you for the question, council member. So um, as you're aware, it is a complicated issue um, that we have been looking at and dealing with for many, many, many years um, as far as that goes. I mean, first and foremost, I think we need to look at the controls. Uh, we need to look at number one, reporting out of, of how many, which we do right now, how many officers we have at that, at that level. Um, as you know, officers have the ability to use either comp time or vacation time and then sick time when they're sick uh, from that standpoint. And we have to limit because of our staffing. Uh, we have to limit when you have officers who are out of training, uh, when you have officers who are out sick, uh, when you have officers that are off on different leaves, then certainly the police department has to be staffed. So we do have controls over what minimum staffing is. And so if an officer goes to put in some comp time off, it may actually get denied, uh, depending on what the staffing levels are. Uh, they get vacation bids. Uh, and also from the standpoint, even from the vacation standpoint, uh, it is, you know, we have to talk to the POA as far as a contractual issue on forcing somebody to go home at a certain time and utilize one bank or, an, or another. So a lot of different things in place, and that is just really just a, a high level view of when we look at it. There's certain things, certain things that we need to look at. I mean, certainly from the standpoint of overtime, uh, the tracking e-resource, which is our system uh, that not only has the ability to track um, overtime, uh, but also secondary employment and uh, other overtime uses in there. So we can better track uh, that portion of it. And then really taking a deeper dive into who is, is at that 480 mark coming up with a plan and it stands right now. And again, it's going to be a contractual issue, but as it stands right now, that 480 mark, we can really only enforce that once a year and have an employee put a plan in for that. Um, so moving forward, we will be looking at talking with the, the POA, having the MOA change so that we can enforce that through, but it really is a balancing act uh, first and foremost for public safety uh, so that we can have officers out in the street. And then secondly, uh, give our employees the ability to take time off. And truly, they're both equally, because we know that we need police officers. They need to take their time off. They need to refresh. Uh, there are a lot of overtime assignments out there that officers uh, take. And sometimes our ability to, to balance those things uh, becomes a challenge. Put him in the machine, Panama. Yeah. Uh, Council Member Carrasco, your uh, mic is live. Uh, thank you. Anything you want to add, Chief Mata? Oh, he's, uh, uh, Chief Tindall's uh, absolutely right. Uh, we can't control what bank they're gonna use. Uh, that's a, a contractual issue that uh, we need to look at. Okay, um, I, I, I wanna point out that um, our auditor did a really good job of um, delineating all the prior audits related to police staffing and it goes back to 2002. So we, we really need to hone in on this issue um, as we heard uh, earlier, um, we are in. Um, we have a, a huge amount of money uh, that that our future taxpayers and employees will have to cover for unfunded liability when it comes to um, retirement, um, and and so we we have to make sure that uh, we are as efficient as we can be. Um, I'll tell you that um, all of us here on council and probably all of the directors. Um, we, we don't get paid by the hour. And so I'm motivated to do my work in the least amount of times, but you know, meetings are meetings and it takes us however long it takes us to get through policy discussions. And, and, and that's part of the work that we signed up for. It's certainly, um, it's well worth the time. Um, but I'm also motivated by efficiency because I like to have a balance in my life and I have two children in my house all day. Um, and, and fortunately uh, for me that I can work from home, but, but I, I'm motivated more, more by efficiency as I think many of our other council members are. And so I like to see um, the police department also motivated by efficiency. Um, and so I'll just leave it at that. 
um, and and expect to have some follow up on on uh, on this interim piece, um, and find the right balance. Um, I'm not saying at all that we shouldn't have overtime. We should certainly have that. I just don't think that. Um, I think it was 46 million as a total on an annual basis. I, I think we could secure a lot more uh, police officers uh, for that amount, which was the earlier conversation. And so I'm going to move on to a recommendation one, I mean two, and, and this is the, to optimize deployment of patrol um, and have any, uh, oh no, this is redistricting, uh, excuse me. I'm, trying to look through my notes. Um, this is for the shift changes. And the shift changes, um, I'll tell you, um, this is only to do with patrol. But I wonder, um, uh, Joe or, or, uh, or one of the chiefs, uh, to maybe give, you, give me some input, um, because it, it, it really got me to thinking about our investigative units. And I have been very anecdotally connect, collecting information from our stakeholders who represent uh, survivors of sexual assault and domestic violence. And when we had a meeting with, um, with our uh, chief uh, Garcia last summer, um, one of the concerns that came up is that uh, the way that the shift changes, there isn't really, um, and this is for the investigative units, there isn't really uh, that time um, for, uh, for maybe some of our younger clients who are a, a really significant amount of, of uh, victims, unfortunately. They, you know, usually the, the, that um, abuse is reported when they're at school or when they're around a, um, a person that they trust, an adult that they trust. And so there, there is a bit of a, dis, uh, of a, between the shift chains for the investigative units, um, I like for us to look at that a little bit more so that we can make sure that we cover um, the, that time frame that is also reflected in the patrol, which is uh, 9 to 8 p.m and having a, a longer overlap um, or maybe having additional shift, whatever um, it is best to have more coverage um, during the busiest times. And so um, that, that um, finding really got me to thinking about the investigative units and what I've been hearing from them. Is there any plans to start taking a look at um, Maybe some of the concerns that we have um, from from um, our residents regarding access um, to any of the detectives, um, because I think currently their shift is um, six a.m. to two p.m. something like that. Thank you for the question, Council Member. So uh, we actually do have um, different shifts within the bureau itself. Um, they are uh, and they should be coverage anywhere from somewhere around seven o'clock in the morning all the way till five o'clock at night. Uh, certainly as far as modifying shifts, we're limited because that's contractual uh, as far as what an officer bids for from that standpoint. Uh, but to your point, uh, we used to have um, a detectives because I know I was one and uh, Chief Mata was one. Uh, they were called night detectives or night generals. And they were ones that essentially work from three o'clock in the afternoon to one o'clock in the morning. Uh, they were in fact the bridge between the bureau um, and uh, patrol and they would often respond out and do investigative support uh, to patrol. It is one thing when we started um, uh, downsizing uh, from personnel and especially up in the bureau. Uh, it was one that was uh, minimized. The positions still are held there today, however, they're vacant. Uh, so it's certainly something that we could uh, consider and look into uh, staffing the night general position again. And again, it just uh, all boils down to uh, department prioritization uh, as far as where those uh, those bodies go when they come out of the academy. Uh, I, I, oh, sorry, go ahead, uh, Chief. Sure, uh, and I just wanted to add what, uh, Dave, uh, what Chief Tindall had mentioned is that because of the, um, the, the uh, not, not having the night detectives, we have detectives if it's a major case uh, that is ongoing that they get called back uh, and handle those cases. So, so there is coverage. Uh, so if there's a, a major case, 
uh, in any of the units, uh, barring the homicide and, and others. Uh, detectives do uh, respond out and, uh, and help out. Right. No, I, I understand that. And that might not be the, the detective that's assigned to the case necessarily, right? And so for follow-up and just for consistency, this is a lot of trauma that goes is involved in these crimes, but um, but thank you for the the information. I appreciate that. If you we could uh, discuss it further offline, um, as is I know that this audit pertains mainly to our only to our patrol officers. Um, Can I add one thing that was so the, the oh of course Kendall and Chief Mata mentioned the night general position. That was actually one position we saw with that was uh, had overtime of associated with it. I don't know how significant it was this past year. That's another position that was funded through or that was staffed through overtime over this past year. Permanently staffed um, through overtime? We saw hours. I don't know if it was permanently staffed. Uh, I'm sorry, say that again. We saw hours uh, uh, coded to night general through the overtime. I don't know if it, the, uh, the, it's permanently staffed by them. Okay, well, I, I can certainly take this this discussion offline and, um, and hopefully we can uh, get to the bottom of, the, of this one. Um, Lastly, I will say that um, um, I, I think that we need to ask the same questions um, of the investigative units only because I think that when the patrol, um, uh, when patrol makes changes that I think it makes sense um, to also have the investigative units make changes. I, um, I think they, they correlate um, but I'm not sure if what the plans are. Um, typically, when there's a when there's changes to patrol, does that um, translate over to the investigative units? It really depends. I mean, there's certainly in separate bureaus and, and officers or detectives. Uh, once assigned, it's still a biddable process. Uh, from there, uh, as you noted, normally the uh, detectives are on a day shift type model and patrol uh, our year long shift change uh, across three separate shifts. Uh, so there are some differences, but uh, for the most part it is a one year model uh, that uh, they're assigned to and bid for. Yes, I, uh, I do appreciate that. Um, I think there, the longer that, that somebody can stay in a position, um, I think it's much more effective. We've seen the research has showed us that. Um, and so maybe taking a look at that um, again. The, the last thing I, I will say is, is um, there was a lot of really good information here. And I hope that, that our police department can really um, take a look at what uh, uh, Joe and his office have, um, have developed here. I, I think this is going to uh, really align with the reimagining of the police department and make these changes. Um, um, can create some better relationships out there um, through community policing, through uh, having um, more of our officers be in stable um, uh, positions over time. I don't know if one year to two year um, time frame um, is the answer, but I think we need to be creative um, in terms of what we have and working with what we have. Um, and then the last thing I will say is that my um, district typically um, isn't as, I'll tell you, isn't as hot as District Lincoln. And I heard uh, council member, uh, as far as I loud and clear, um, she definitely has a lot more responses, a lot more calls um, than any other district. Um, uh, my, my district doesn't fall too far behind. It's still in the 13 to 20,000. Um, incidents uh, for priority one, two, four responses. And this was based on last year's numbers. And, uh, and one of the things that, that happens in my district is um, because, and this might be very similar to what you were saying, uh, Council Member Cohen, we're on opposite ends, right, of, of San Jose and the boundaries. And, and, uh, and criminals know that, and, it, and they know that it takes longer to get to those ends. Um, than the city center, right? O or near Lincoln, where most of our police officers uh, probably are responding um, or, or should be responding because if, if uh, District Lincoln needs more resources, then I think that they should be deployed that way. Um, I think if we um, stick to, to the concept of equity, um, then we need to make sure that those uh, districts that have more incidents um, receive the type of resources that they need. Um, 
and it's not taken away from anybody, but it's responding to what the, our reality is. Um, but I, I, I do want to say that my um, that when we as we move forward, that we take a look at um, not just the 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 the, uh, the incidents that happen in um, in terms of numbers, but we also take a look at time frames because in District Paul, there's a lot of uh, burglaries um, that happen, a lot of you know swiping of packages. Um, they just know that 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 district um, has a higher income level, so um, there's a there's just that type of crime, um, and are targeted um, because they're pretty much uh, far away from the city center, and so there's a bit of a delayed response time. I'm sure that um, Council Member um, Jimenez, and I know he advocates for a South County or South um, uh, Base Station. Uh, to 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 address that. So I also wanted just to bring that point up that not only just to take a look at the incidents and and uh, the number, but also take a look at the time um, during December, during you know November to December, um, when it's Christmas time. That's when there's a lot a lot more burglaries. Right now, I know what is really. Um, uh, pop in for my district is a lot of car incidents. Unfortunately, um, Chief Tyndall, you uh, shared with me that that somebody lost their life in protecting their property um, about two weeks ago. In the same, um, uh, and this is the 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 piece that that uh, of uh, of the vehicle that gets removed from a lot of Priuses, uh, catalytic converters. And I had the same um, thing happen to to a car uh, to my to my home <laughs> twice in one week. Um, our cars were targeted, and they, they did manage to get this catalytic converter that's underneath the the, the car. And they took seriously thirty seconds. We looked at the video that we have at our home. It took them thirty seconds uh, to unload a jack to take this piece off from underneath the car and to leave. And so there's different crimes for different parts of our city. And I hope that's taken into consideration as we're moving forward and as we're allocating different resources. Um, and so those were, were my, my comments. Lastly, I just wanna say thank you to our police department. I know it's difficult to um, be under scrutiny uh, in, in an audit and I know we, uh, Joe does it as gently and with uh, the kindest heart um, because he is a conservator of, of funds um, and uh, for our residents as we all are. So um, thank you all for participating and thank you for your responses. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Pross. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, and I'll be brief, a lot of uh, the questions have already been asked and discussions been had. Uh, thank you. Joe as well for the, the audit um, and to your team. Uh, appreciate that and appreciate the briefing as well. Um, and thank you to Chief Tyndall for the response here um, and appreciate everything was green lit, but I think even that being said, we know that we've had audits in the past, some that recommend some of the same recommendations and green lighting it doesn't necessarily mean that we have the ability to do it as we know that because staffing as being the biggest one, um, Certainly, we, we've had that challenge for, for years now. Um, I just had a couple questions that I did not see addressed throughout the report. And, and, and this is really um, anecdotal from what I've heard from uh, police officers. But um, we switched over to the one-year shift um, just recently. And I think that went permanent. Was it last year, uh, Chief Tindall, or two years ago? I think it was two years, it was two years ago. Two years ago. Okay. So, um, and so uh, what I've been hearing is that uh, with the one year shift change, that there have been a lot more vacancies throughout the course of those years that shift um, as people test and make it into units um, or as people promote um, or retire and that, um, 
previously with the, the six month shift change, it allowed for maybe a shorter time where there might've been a vacancy and then a new shift and you fill all those holes. Uh, I didn't see that addressed in the audit. So um, I'll start with Joe just to kind of see, is that something that you were able to catch on um, and it just didn't pop up, it wasn't maybe significant? So that's a great question. So we didn't we didn't look, um, and maybe Brittany can can help me if I'm stating incorrectly. But we didn't go down to that unit level so much. We were looking more at the broad trends. We were seeing that you know as as we noted earlier, we have been able to reduce the number of vacancies over the last couple of years, and with the you know the the, the different being able to staff up the academies with the higher ed program, we see we can see that in the future we'll, we can hopefully keep bringing that that vacancy number down. Uh, but in terms of the you know the individual units at the vacancy vacancy rates in the individual units we weren't really digging to that level is Brittany, did did you go deeper than that i'm not no you you have it correct joe that is yeah yeah but but that is you know that is that is a very good point um again we were looking at that a little higher level and council member to your point um you know as you know uh, we used to have relief officers uh, so when we went to the one year shift change, certainly when we have retirements or we have officers that go out on leaves, uh, we have a limited ability to start moving officers around to fill those vacancies. Certainly as academies come out, that's the first thing we do is uh, put and, and try and fill in those vacancies that we have uh, so that we can uh, maintain stability uh, on the team. So it's actually assigned officers uh, that are on the teams versus moving officers around. Uh, but it certainly is and going to the one year shift change that has been a problem. Uh, hopefully with different staffing models and the way we look at it, we either uh, attain relief spots again or just uh, even out just based on, you know, our, our young staff uh, that won't be retiring for a long time, uh, some consistency um, on the teams themselves. Yeah, I know it's just something, again, anecdotally, I've been hearing um, and actually, uh, you know, from a lot of sergeants as well, where maybe you can't go with with too many vacancies, um, you know, once you ask them to cover uh, a couple of different districts. And so, um, and what I was hearing is that it's become more frequent, the, the request for, um, for overtime spots uh, or holdovers. And that one of the factors, at least that has been brought up to me was the, the, the shift change and how um, there's now just maybe vacancies that are felt for a longer period of time. Uh, I think it is just worthwhile. I actually am a, a fan of the one year shift change. I think it, it allows for us to have our officers out in the community to engage with community members better. So I, I don't want to go backwards, but if there are some challenges because this, you know, this is new a couple years in, I think we should try to identify those. And again, I just didn't see it in the audit. And so I just want to make sure that um, if that is something, at least at the, the police department, right, is looking at that. So. Uh, for yourself, um, Chief Mata, right, uh, being able to identify um, where there are some challenges with uh, with some of this timing and the fact that it might not overlap perfectly when you have um, promotions or people getting into units or retirements, whatever it may be, and you and then now we're just completely reliant for the rest of a a, you know, a shift on on overtime or holdovers, um, and. Sorry, let me look at my notes here. Uh, that was it. My last comment actually is just um, echoing what Councilmember Esparza said, which is uh, there are a lot of things that, uh, as Chief Tindall looked off, that our officers are doing overtime for. And, you know, as you were rattling off that list, uh, more than half, maybe three quarters plus, are things that I have all asked for. Um, and so, I think that we just have to be aware of that, right? That as we, we look at sort of these numbers, um, there's a lot that our community is asking for, thus a lot that we are asking for, and um, and that we shouldn't necessarily uh, look at just these high numbers as, as something negative. We should look at it as something that that's not the solution. We don't wanna solve all these uh, requests for service with overtime officers uh, or which worth overtime. Um, but until then, the balance is, I think, also incumbent upon us to decide, do we want to stop asking for these things? Um, and I know I don't, <laughs> um, you know, and I know that my community uh, doesn't want me to to stop. And so I just think that that's important that, that us, you know, that we, we recognize that. And thank you, Councilmember Sparza, for, for highlighting that. 
Um, and, and thank you uh, as well to our, our hardworking uh, officers that are out there um, that are putting in these long hours and, and uh, again, for the most part, uh, hours that we're really demanding, uh, we are demanding of them and our community is. Thanks. Thank you. Councilmember Mayhan. Thanks, Mayor. I'll be real quick. I know we want to vote here. Uh, thanks to Joe and the team. Excellent audit. I found it super educational. Really, really appreciate it. Um, also on that point about overtime, I, I wanted to point to exhibit 26 on page 60 of the report that noted that um, officer initiated activities appear to closely track with overtime usage. And I just, I thought that that point that proactive policing is, which is something that I think we, we generally uh, want to be encouraging, think is a good thing, is also highly correlated with overtime. I just thought that was, that was fascinating, but it, it led me to a follow-up question that's one of the few things I haven't heard us ask yet, unless I missed it, which is, um, Joe, did you look at comparisons with other cities' use of overtime and kind of where we fall? Are we, are we an outlier or, or is this pretty normal? So I, we didn't look at the specific dollars spent at overtime. Um, I know uh, being an auditor, I'm very tuned into the, uh, the rest of the auditing community and there are audits of police overtime <laughs> all over the place. So it is, it is something as has been noted before, uh, overtime usage in, um, for, for different reasons has, is, has been a concern uh, in other jurisdictions um, uh, San Francisco uh, um, in, in more recently had had not of that in, in that area, um, but but it, it's it's something that has been noted uh, throughout uh, across a number of cities that police, uh, overtime in, in police departments is something that has been growing for for different reasons. Okay, so so may not be so. I mean, you don't have a comparison here, but may not be so. Not unique. not a specific comparison in terms of dollars. Okay. No, not by no, time no. ahead. Yeah, no problem. Cool. Just curious. And then um, my only other question, which we already did touch on, was report writing and follow up. I mean, that that trend line in um, mm -hmm. Exhibit Twenty Eight on page sixty four of the report is kind of incredible. I mean, that's like more than a doubling of hours in report writing in just the last five years which um, and accounts for, it looks to me like as much overtime as almost all the other uh, categorized uses of overtime combined. So I know we touched on that earlier, but just maybe back to um, our acting chief or incoming chief, um, is there more we can do around use of technology to streamline reporting as I'm sure this has been explored, but anything else that, that might be investments we could make? I, I'm just amazed at how the hours of report writing and follow-up have, have gone up over the last five years or so. Thanks for the question, council member. So, um, you know, there's a lot of different details that go into it. I mean, number one, the complexity of calls has certainly gone up. Uh, like we mentioned, the data points that we collect nowadays um, has gone up. Some of that voluntary, some of it legislative mandate, uh, some of the different things we do. I mean, I will say from, from our standpoint, I'd probably say we're one of the most sophisticated police agencies in the nation as far as our report writing and as far as the data points that we're collecting. Uh, so I think when you look at that and when you look at our staffing levels, when you look at responding to calls, because a lot of other agencies, uh, you know, the, the police officers have, have time to, to stop in the middle of their shift and write reports. Uh, sometimes we don't have that ability. So it really pushes us towards the end of shift. Certainly our mandate to get the reports written. Um, so we're constantly looking at things. That, and, you know, even the last couple of years we've been working with the county, uh, because they still um, have uh, forms in triplicate and quadruple form uh, that our officers have to fill out by hand. So certainly when we look at certain type of technologies that mesh uh, and when we put a name in, it can cross across all forms, uh, that is helpful. Uh, but it's always to integrating different software, integrating different report systems is always a challenge for us that we always try and keep up on and integrate it as best we can. Great. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that. And I, obviously the data collection is important and, and is often mandated and, and we, we want to be the best at collecting and analyzing data. So I, I appreciate that, but I guess it's just something we'll keep our eyes on. And I know you guys are looking at ways of improving. I just thought I'd call that out again, because because that line I just thought was quite striking. So um, great. Thank you. And uh, I'm done.
Thank you. Uh, Councilman Perales, is that from before? No, sorry, it was a new one. I, I, I apologize, I forgot to mention because it was a constituent that uh, did uh, inquire on something and I just wanted, I, I said I would forward it, so I want to forward it. Um, there, there is uh, an, a, an interest in seeing that we uh, minimize any added um, enforcement or overtime that may be utilized for uh, cruising events. Uh, and I know that we talked about this before in committee that um, that they're, they're, you know, I think uh, everybody would prefer maybe a focus on uh, the sideshows, um, but um, but wanted to be able to, to to forward that, and certainly I think could be worthwhile of a future conversation in regards to something that uh, at one point many years ago um, was was banned in our community, um, and I think is is certainly warrants a, a further conversation, but uh, not for today. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll try to be concise with my questions because I know a lot's been asked already, but I want to first just ask about civilianization. I appreciated uh, Joe's analysis and Joe, thank you to you and your team again for, for all your great work. Um, I referred to the, I think it was a 22 audit, uh, 2010 audit that um, talked about civilianization. A lot of civilianization's happened. I know the department's worked hard to really try to figure out where do we really need sworn staff and where don't we? There's some additional positions that were recommended but not civilianized, including uh, pre-processing the range information desk and training. And I'm just wondering, are, are any of those positions or others, are, are there any other sort of low hanging fruit here or are we convinced we civilianize everything we can civilianize? Thanks for the question, Mr. Mayor. You know, in that regard, I think there's a, a lot of things, especially nowadays, with the reimagining process that we can look at. Uh, I know there's gonna be a lot of talk and discussion as far as what are police responding to? Uh, what are others that are non-police? Uh, what can they respond to? So we can talk about CSOs from that standpoint. Certainly right. internally, and I think that we're at the point now where we are gonna look at every position here in this police department to take a look and see whether or not uh, that needs to be a sworn position or whether or not that can be filled by uh, somebody else who's not sworn. Uh, as you right. know, uh, that may be a contractual issue, uh, but we'll work through that with the POA. Uh, but I certainly think now, and now is the time to look into those different things as far as where we're at. Thanks, and I appreciate you mentioning CSOs and the recommendations, I think it was nine and 10, or I think we're really uh, spot on and seeing how we can continue to use, I think what has become a great asset to our city and our, our department, which is that the CSO team. Um, I, the, the question, the issue about airport staffing I saw reference to it in the audit, but I wasn't clear. Is all airport staffing done with overtime or just some? Uh, well, I'd say the vast majority is. I mean, the supervisorial staff out there is full-time. Um, our canine detection dogs are full-time, uh, but the officers that you see working the checkpoints out there are all on an overtime basis. Okay. And was that always so, or was there a time when we were better staffed where we just had regularly staffed people there? Uh, there was a time, and uh, I can't remember the year, but it was many years ago, I want to say at least seven or eight, if not more. Um, okay. I know that there was, uh, when we looked at different, uh, when we started going through essentially downsizing the police department at that time, uh, that was the FTEs that were pulled. And the decision at that time was it was cheaper to put uh, overtime positions out there than FTEs. Right, okay. And Joe, I appreciate you clarifying, you know, with the civil unrest last year, I know that ballooned our numbers in ways that were, uh, you know, exaggerated, um, but but appreciate what you said, which was that you think the numbers would have gone up a little bit anyway. Is that right? Yeah, so it was, it was a couple factors and the the civil unrest was definitely a large factor, but we were seeing, we, we, we had that same question. So we looked at the numbers running through May 25th. So that was the date that, that George Floyd died. Um, and we saw we were trending just above what we had in 1819, but we were below 1718. So we did come back down. We had, we had, we were still below that high from like two years back, but we, we, we didn't continue to see that decline. And that could come to get back to what Councilman Prowlis said about that one year shift. If that was, you know, if there were some extra vacancies there that we were, were getting, I, I don't, I don't know specifically where the, where the additional one, where the additional overtime was. Okay. Th thanks, Joe. I appreciate you guys doing that additional analysis. And then um, this issue of redistricting, I know it's something we've talked about for a long time. 
and I guess we're getting going now. I understand it's there's a lot of resources and so forth, but in the response from the city manager's office or, or PD, said, I think it's on page three of our response, they would take until mid 2023 to get redistricting done. Was that a typo? Or is it really going to take that long? Yes, Mr. Mayor. Uh, so we're in the process right now. We have money set aside um, to begin the process. There's a lot of different things that go into it, including uh, not only the report itself where they come back and give us an idea whether or not we're redistricting the entire city or whether or not we can do it on a limited basis. Uh, but there's a lot of technological issues that come with it, uh, not only from the deployment of police, um, but also the uh, changing of uh, district boundaries uh, and divisional boundaries. Uh, it even goes so far as to radio channels and the ability to change the radio channels based on the workload. Uh, it also deals with our communications personnel. So um, in a very high level way, there's a lot of different things that go into that that are well beyond uh, just putting essentially police officers out there. And uh, you know the, the redistricting portion of it's gonna be the start when we uh, find a vendor and pick them and they can through their initial report. That'll let us know, you know, first of all, how deep we have to go with redistricting and really at that point, it'll uh, paint the way as to how far we need to reach to the depths of district channels and technology and changing forms and, and all these different things. So uh, that is a realistic timeline, uh, not to say that we couldn't make modifications to it um, and redeploy staff uh, based on what we're looking at. But again, we really do have to look at span of control uh, and what that's gonna look like in a district channel. Okay. Uh, yeah, I don't pretend to be able to appreciate the challenges here. Uh, I just assume we were just drawing lines on the map, but it sounds like it's a whole lot more than that. Uh, last question I had, um, just about the, just the, the, the management issue and the, the supervision of, of the overtime. You know, there was a, a series, I think a 2016 audit um, that made a series of recommendations. And I'm looking in my notes here. I think it was uh, somewhere in the 50s or 60s, uh, page 58 of the audit that refers to this, that the overtime tracking recommendations that for the most part were, or it sounds as though for the most part they were not implemented. Is that something we can, we're going to get implemented or was there a reason why those recommendations were not accepted? I mean, I'm just wondering, is this something that's in process or is there a difference of opinion between SJPD and the auditor? I can jump into that. So part of what we've seen is, so they've done some pieces of it, but you know, when we did the audit, the comp time liability was around $13 million and it's just kept growing to the 21 million that we've seen now. We're seeing more officers reaching that 480 limit. And so, you know, the, they have, the, the, so some of the recommendations in that, there's three recommendations that were kind of view them as kind of a package and they, uh, we're just not, can, we have a hard time calling something implemented uh, if the department makes a makes an effort, and then what we're seeing is that it's not fixed. Uh, and so, you know, we're we have a few more recommendations. Some on the comp time, comp time side of things, we do have some some more control type uh, recommendations in this audit. And uh, as Chief Tyndall said earlier, um, it is a controls issue. It's um, you know the. There's a couple different, we desegregated the, the pieces in the overtime, or at least tried to show, and, and we had this conversation obviously earlier with Councilman Prawls and Councilman Sparza. There's some positions like the suppression pay cars and some of the things that council had asked for the foot patrol, and that we're gonna be using overtime for those, but it's these, right. these other pieces that we just really gotta get our hands on before we can really start drawing that down. And one, it's the staffing piece, we get to fully reduce the vacancies, get the controls in place, then we can start seeing these things come down and then we can, Really take a hard look at whether you know we fully met the met the goals of the recommendation of 2016 and these, of course. Okay, I I hadn't gone back to the 2016 audit, but I assumed that there were specific sort of changes in process procedures, for example, that were recommended. And I'm just wondering, you know, did we at least implement those? I understand we may not have achieved the goal. But yeah. Well, some did, of them are. We make the changes we need to start making. Well, uh, I'll give you an example for one on the, uh, the the overtime. I'm trying to pull up the specific language so I get it right. Um, you know, on, on the comp time liability piece, we had a, a series of recommendations 
Um, trying to think, D2. Lower the comp allowable comp time balance for 480 hours, explore a comp time buyout program, or consider mandatory comp time balance buyout upon promotion between sworn ranks. So that's one that's subject to meet and confer that, that's not implemented. So that's, you know, that's okay, the sort of I thing get we're it. looking at. So we've got to negotiate that and meet and confer. So there's, a few, there's a few items like that. Okay, well, I look forward to moving those along because it sounds like it, they're, they're all important. Okay, uh, any final comments or questions? All right, there was a vote to receive the report or a motion rather, let's vote. Uh, Mayor, I, I do, I just- Oh, quickly. forgive me, Councilman no, Arenas. No, no, no I, I did that really quick. Um, I was just thinking about the transition from uh, Chief uh, Mata and uh, wondering if there's, um, if his feedback is captured in this, uh, in the recommendations or, uh, and or if we could provide some additional time so that um, he could also be part of this response um, in the audit. Would, would you like perhaps that we would come back for him to be able to respond in a few weeks? I, that would be great. I, um, I, I don't know that he was part of this uh, discussion. And so I, I think it would be important beginning with okay. an, an official. I can't recall who made the motion. Is that could I just check in though with staff? Because when, when we respond to audits, it's pretty thorough and involves yeah. quite a bit of staff in the department and in the manager's office. So I just wanted to check in to see if if uh, Chief Mata wanted an opportunity or does he feel like you know you guys were pretty well integrated in terms of the response here? No, I was. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, City Manager. I was involved in the audit, so uh, our, our responses are are complete. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right, great. Let's uh, vote on the motion. Jimenez? Aye. Perales? Aye. Owen? Aye. Roscoe? Aye. Davis? Aye. Gasparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Ricardo? <clears throat> Aye. Thank you. Okay, uh, item 4.2 Independent Investigation of Police Misconduct Work Plan. We do have a presentation, oh, Jennifer and Siobhan. Yes, hang on. Hang on, Jennifer Chambray, Director of Employee Relations and Human Resources. I think Siobhan is going to kick us off. Great. All right. Can you hear me, Mayor? We can. Okay. Thanks. So um, Jennifer Chambray um, and I have worked together on um, looking at the, the task given to us by council about potentially moving investigations of misconduct out of internal affairs to another entity. Uh, next slide. So as you recall, in August of last year, uh, the city council directed myself and the city manager to look at recommendations for how we could take over investigations of police misconduct, including reallocating resources and en enabling the IPA to make factual findings. Then after measure G passed, uh, at the Rules and Open Government Committee, we were directed the IPA and the city manager to come back to council with a work plan, including policy formation and budgetary impacts. So currently the work plan consists of two parts. Number one, um, hiring a consultant to evaluate if the IPA or some other alternative entity should be considered for conducting investigations. And the report would also recommend a model and a staffing plan. Uh, the number two part is to have staff explore alternative options for investigating allegations of misconduct that are independent of the police department, but still within the city manager's authority. So here we have a timeline um, of both of those processes. The RFP has been posted for the consultant. Um, so we're looking at uh, a process through August 31st for that. Um, with the, in the end, we would return to the city council with recommendations. And then after that, uh, negotiate with the uh, San Jose Police Officers Association if, if appropriate. Um, and then the, on the exploration of alternatives, we're doing that very quickly right now. Uh, we would. Um, talk to the POA about that as appropriate, and then return to the city council in a closed session with an update by April 13th. 
Great. Thank you, Siobhan. I'm sorry, was there anything further? Nope, just with that, we're recommending your approval of the work plan. Okay, thank you very much. Let's uh, let's go to members of the community and we'll come back. Uh, Victoria Pardita. Welcome, Victoria. Uh, your device appears to be muted right now if you're trying to talk. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Okay. Hi, my name is Victoria Partida. I'm calling in to support the mayor's efforts to move the police misconduct investigations out of the police department, ensuring that there is an independent voice in these investigations provide for better public trust, accountability, and transparency. I urge the city council to join the mayor in moving forward with these police reforms. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Peter Ortiz. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can, Peter. Great, thank you. Uh, hello, my name is Peter Ortiz and I'm an East San Jose community leader, trustee for the Santa Clara County Board of Education. I'm commenting in support of moving police, police investigations out of the purview of the police department. No government entity should be entrusted to investigate itself. As public officer, officials, it's imperative that we can guarantee to the community that there will be an independent voice in misconduct investigations and then those investigations are rooted in transparency, strive for accountability and build uh, public trust. For far too long, our IPA office has been an oversight body in name only with no teeth or power to investigate and a lack of ability to report factual findings and concerns. Um, this work plan will bring much needed reform that is in alignment with the calls from the community to hold bad actors accountable for their actions. I urge the council and the mayor to move forward with these reforms. Thank you. Thank you. Gabriela Chavez Lopez. Welcome, Gabriela. Good evening, mayor and members of the city council. Uh, my name is Gabriela Chavez Lopez, and I am here representing um, as the president of Latina Coalition of Silicon Valley and as a D3 resident. Um, you know, the tragedies and lives that were taken at the hands of uh, peace officers only compelled us as a collective to confront these chronic and deep seated racism um, that pervades all of our societal institutions, including our police departments. And I'm here to express um, our support for the city of San Jose's independent investigation of police misconduct work plan and supporting the work plan proposed by IPA and CMO to evaluate options for investigations of police misconduct. This work plan aligns with community aspirations towards police reform, such as meaningful systemic changes that hold officers accountable for their actions. So we fully support you and the city council moving forward with this very important police reform item. Thank you. Thank you. Brian? Hello, Mr. Mayor and Council. Thank you very much. I do agree that would be helpful to move it to a to an oversight. No government agency should oversee itself. On the other, and also, I hope we maintain that police put up with a lot of grief, <laughs> more so than what most of us do on a regular day when you walk out in the community. At times, police are a literal target. I, I couldn't stand on a line, and listen to people swear and say obscenities and terrible things about my family and all that kind of stuff and not emotionally respond because people are people. Um, but there needs to be that transparency. As long as there's balance for the officers and the community, I think that's really critical to restore hope and trust. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Brian. Okay, oh, uh, Brenda Sintejas. Hi, good evening, everyone. My name is Brenda Sintejas. I'm a resident of District 5. I just calling today to fully support this to be moved to an oversight um, com committee. Uh, this independent investigation is one step closer closer to ensuring that our community gets the accountability and the trust that should be happening with the city and the community. I want to thank you for bringing this um, item. And I do want to say these things are important because there are incidents like what happened at La Pala with David Tovar. We are yet to see answers and accountability for the officers that came in there and killed this man and not only threatened our community, but our children who were in Zoom class. And I yet to see accountability for the death and the slaughter of this man who 
deserved to have due process in court and he did not get a chance to even have his trial and they also put a lot of kids in danger and this type of um, committee committee independent investigation will help the community for cases like this and I hope that the family of David Tolbert gets closure and the community who is also um, right now suffering from trauma from what happened this day. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, returning to council. Questions or comments? Councilmember Is Sparza? Um, oh, there's Siobhan. Hi. Um, I wanted to ask um, Siobhan, what do you, uh, are you able to implement Measure G moving forward? So currently um, we are, we have implemented looking at department initiated complaints. Those complaints are coming over to our office and we are auditing them in the same fashion as we do citizen complaints. With the other parts of Measure G, we are currently, we don't have the bandwidth to take on those, those additional tasks right now. The reason being that our staff is very much um, enmeshed in the police reforms work plan. Um, once we finish those items, we'll have a better capacity to do the measure, the full extent of Measure G. But again, right now we are uh, devoting a lot of staff time to the various components of the police reforms work plan. And so what would you need to do both the work plan and Measure G? So I would probably need uh, an additional staff person uh, who has some expertise in um, number one, statistical sampling, and so that we could take a look at the reports that we'd like to, to look at in terms of how can we best, um, you know, how can we best choose things to look at and request records in a way that's manageable and as, um, you know, valid in terms of findings. Uh, so again, I think I would need a, an analyst that has policy and uh, the ability to uh, to do work works with statistics. And would this be a one-time thing because of the work plan? I would think not because those current uh, qualifications are something that my current staff does not have. Okay. Thank you. I, um, I, uh, I would like to um, move to approve the work plan, but um, would like to also ask the city manager's office to review the independent police auditor's staffing needs um, or the budget. I think that the, um, the work before us is great and it's an investment in our community and um, we need to make sure that we give the independent police auditor the tools to meet both our community needs as well as state requirements. So that's the yeah. motion. Second. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Rayner. Thank you, Councilmember Mayor. Rayner. Oh, there you go. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Sorry, it's, it's getting late. I'm getting slower. Um, so I, I appreciate the, the report back and um, it, along the lines of what uh, Council Member Esparza was asking uh, in terms of uh, budget and um, department needs, I see that the, that the, that the timeline uh, or the work plan is just outside of the budget. Uh, it, in, in other words, it doesn't line up with our budget timeline. So would that mean that we would look at um, budgeting um, the if there's a product here in terms of transferring um, that investigative uh, ability to the IPA, would that be something that we pursue in mid-year? I'm gonna um, ask Dave Sykes to, to weigh in on that since he's more familiar with budget process than I am. Dave, do you want me to do it? Um, I'll, I'll help here, uh, Jennifer McGuire, assistant city manager. So I think when we evaluate the budget, I mean, obviously, if, if we were to transfer the responsibilities over, that would involve 
I think potentially cutting, um, uh, making, uh, cutting uh, costs out of the police department and transferring them to either the IPA or the um, another entity, depending on what comes out of it. And so I don't know what the net costs would be. Again, this, is, this will all come. We would have to see if we could, depending on the timing of, of this and you know meeting conferring and what have you, um, we could potentially look at you know uh, doing something on um, in our annual report that's heard by the council in October, um, at, at least to get us through the remainder of the fiscal year. That'd probably be the best place to do it if we're ready, because usually we're in a balanced budget situation mid year unless we could gather up savings somewhere to implement it and formally implement it through the next budget process. But there's ways depending on the cost of it that we may be able to address it in the end report or the mid-year um, and then, then fully get it ongoing in the, the next year's budget process. Wonderful. And and um, is that something that would automatically happen or should we uh, include that in the motion? Um, yeah, when we brought, if when we bring back the item to the council based on what, you know, what's recommended based on the analysis, uh, the budget implications would be part of that and you would, you would, you would do that at that time. Mm -hmm. Thank you. What, what the outcome is. Thank you. I, I, I appreciate that. The other question that I have, as you all heard, and, and thank you for all of the um, folks who stayed up this late to um, express their opinions about this item. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, and, uh, and obviously, our, our community wants to provide and continue to provide their feedback. Um, but I'm not sure where where we are going to engage them um, according to the work plan and the and the next steps. How, how is that going to work? How will a consultant do this? Um, how will they include all the diverse community voices? Um, just uh, if you could share a little bit more about that. Is there something that we're going to include in the RFP to to require that and and um, how, how would we make this work so that it's as you know done as quickly as possible? So, council member, the the RFP is very tailored to the direction given, which was moving investigations out of internal affairs to another entity and or to my office. Um, so, in terms of the input, we are looking for input from a, a more limited group of persons than we are for the other items on the work plan. It's a very, it's a very technical, um, it has very, uh, a lot of technical moving parts. Uh, it's something that people in the general community would not know about, but in terms of um, it, since the, since the direction was so limited, we are just seeking a, a limited number of people to weigh in on it, which would be city staff, police department, um, uh, members of the POA board of directors, um, our staff, uh, past IPAs uh, to weigh in on it. Okay, so uh, past IPAs, you're, you're saying, would be another um, source. So there'd be somebody else outside of just you, Siobhan? Yes. Okay, I, I just wanted to, to make sure that it's balanced. Um, I'm seeing here now that uh, some of the some of the stakeholders that you just mentioned, um, Office of Employee Relations would also be in there. Okay, um, I just wanted to make sure if if we needed to have community input that we provided an opportunity. But I understand what you're saying that this is a, a more technical um, report and uh, requires maybe of a different audience here or participants. Um, uh, so, so thank you for your response. Thank you. Um, Councilmember Sparza, uh, could you just uh, restate the motion for all of us so we get it? To or, or accept, oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> that's okay. To, uh, I move to accept the report and, um, and then to ask the city manager's office to review um, budget and staffing needs to meet the requirements of Measure G. So okay, nothing great. specific, but to review it so that we could see what options we might have for budget so that we can meet our legislative requirements. Got it. Okay. Thank you, Councilor. 
Yeah, I appreciate this transition is not going to happen overnight. We've got a lot of negotiating and a lot of uh, figuring out and then hiring probably too. So I know this is it's going to be a, a journey. So thank you everyone for your work and getting us to the starting line. Uh, any uh, other questions? All right, let's vote on Councilmember Sparza's motion. Menes? Yes. Morales? Aye. Owen? Aye. Roscoe? Aye. Davis? Aye. Sparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mayhem? Aye. Jones? Aye. Licardo? Aye. All right, thank you. Uh, we're on to item 5.1, which is award of construction contract for 2021 local streets concrete number one project. Move approval. Second. All right, uh, any questions or let's go to the public. Uh, any comments from the public on this item 5.1, award of construction contract on local streets? I see no hands. We'll come back and vote. Menez? Yes. Rallis? Aye. Owen? Owen? Aye. Thank you. Carrasco? Aye. Davis? Aye. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Ricardo? Aye. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. We now have 37 more miles of curb ADA compliant curb ramps. That's a good thing. All right, we are on to the final item of the evening. That is 8.1, a purchase and sale agreement for the property at 300 Enzo Drive. There is a presentation, I'm guessing, Nancy? Yes, and thank you very much for this evening. And we're gonna make this short, but we'll end on a, hopefully end on a good note. Um, Kevin is bringing up, thank you very much. I wanted to uh, say that the team is very excited to bring to you tonight a key Measure T project, which is uh, securing a, a, police, a, a facility for a police training and academy. The property is on roughly 4.7 acres, uh, roughly 100,000 square feet, suitable for police training and academy. We looked at a very long uh, list of properties to get this far. Um, Kevin, can you turn to the next slide, please? Thank you. Here is the building um, just off Silicon Valley Boulevard and on Rue Ferrari and Enzo. Uh, so that, that gives you a, a bird's eye view of the property. And Kevin, if you can move on to the next one. So the purchase price is $18.5 million, which is below the appraised price for the property. And that Measure T will fund the acquisition dollars. It's an as is sale. The city will furnish a 1033 letter, which brings timing and tax advantage to the seller. We've done that in uh, several other purchases previously. And we have already completed staff uh, due diligence. There are no environmental or title issues. Next, please. Here you have the front door view of the Enzo property. And with that, I, I just wanted to say this is a former Western digital building. It has good bones. It requires less in terms of um, cost for bringing the building to what we want than any other we looked at. And just really wanted to thank team members, Matt Kano and um, acting chief Tyndall, as well as Dominic Onanato and Lisa Perez and Kevin Ice. And with that, we're here to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Nancy. And thanks to everyone who worked on this, Chief Tyndall, uh, Kevin and everyone. Um, it's wonderful to see us get to this point. I know uh, Councilmember Jimenez in particular will be happy to see there's a pathway to be able to reactivate the South Station. Uh, are there any comments from the public on this? This is 8.1, the purchase and sale agreement for property at 300 Enzo Drive for the Police Training Center. Okay, there's no one who's raising their hands. So we'll come back to the council uh, and Councilmember Jimenez. I think you were reading my mind, Mayor. Uh, I was thinking about the substation as we're <laughs> <laughs> thinking about this. I, I think uh, my community is well aware that uh, we've been sharing for some time that in order to 
hopefully someday open the substation that we need to find a place to relocate the training facility. So very excited that this really, really gets one of the key pieces in place to be able to do that. Um, also want to thank Nancy and the whole team for all the work. I know, I think when we initially discussed this site, it was upwards of six, seven months ago. So recognize there's been a lot of work. Um, and with that, uh, very excited and, and I'll just uh, move approval. Second. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Um uh, I, I do want to really call out the fact this is a, we got this thing at a bargain and I know there aren't many bargains these days. So this is a, certainly a tremendous accomplishment. The question about, um, maybe this is for Dominic Honorado or, or others, but what we think the costs are to retrofit to, for the tenant improvements to really make this usable for the department. Uh, we have any sense of that scale? Thank you, um, Matt Kano, Director of Public Works. Um, right now our budget for the project is roughly $45 million. Um, so taking out, um, taking out the acquisition money from that, um, we're really close uh, within the remaining budget to um, do the initial project that we need to do in order to get the minimum needs out there and activate uh, and allow police to move out of the current substation. We referenced in the memo that we do think we're probably possibly a little short of that. And there's the Charcot project um, in Measure T, which is going to have savings of up where we're tracking around five to $6 million that we alluded, I mentioned in the memo that we may come with a recommendation in the near future to add that money to this project to get that minimum scope. Um, uh, but that is our goal with that possible additional Charcot money to get the minimum scope we need for the project um, for this point in time. Okay, wonderful. Uh, it's great to see and wonderful that we got a high quality uh, structure for this. Um, Councilor Menez, your hand is still raised. Is that from before? You, no, it's it's just a quick question for Matt. Sure, please. go uh, ahead. I, I know that uh, the sense I got from the discussions I've had with, uh, I think it was Nancy and some other folks is that uh, parking may be an issue or, or we're, we're trying to figure that out. And And so my, you know, I'm not sure if I'm blowing anything sort of out in the open I'm not supposed to. So, uh, but but uh, are, are you actively having conversations, Matt, with Caltrans? And if so, uh, and if you're allowed to share whether that's even happening, uh, if you can share sort of where that is, and if you expect a resolution on that in, in the not too distant future. Yes, Councilor. Thank you for the question. And we did uh, we we do mention that in the memo specifically um, that we have um, a few options for parking. Um, since a lot of the parking lot will need to be used, uh, the existing parking lot for the building will be need to be used for the outdoor exercise and other outdoor activities. Um, we are looking at two options for parking, you know, lease. And the primary option is really to lease a portion of Caltrans property. And we feel really good about that. We've had a few really great conversations with Caltrans. Um, there's two Caltrans properties, one triangular piece, um, about a quarter mile from the, um, um, facility just down the street, and then, then a larger piece just south of the emergency housing site, which is a little farther. Um, and so one or both of those sites, um, we're looking at leasing from Caltrans for parking, and the conversations have been extremely positive with Caltrans so far. It's just going to take a little bit of time to lock that lease down. Um, and um, so that's that's the primary option we're looking at at parking. Okay, and, and then just one other thing that came up as you were talking, and so I appreciate that. I know that... Um, Obviously, Coyote Creek Trail is not too far from there, but there doesn't seem to be uh, any sort of direct access to that. And, and that is what I imagine, as you state in the memo, that uh, where we envision the, the recruits running and exercising and doing some of that stuff as well, right? And so do we envision having conversations with some of the other property owners, maybe some of the doctors that own some neighboring land there to see if we can get access? Because if you go, if you're looking at the slide that's on the screen, if you that field uh, in the back there, uh, you just keep going straight and you'll hit Coyote Creek. It's not very far. Curious what your thoughts are about that, or uh, Nancy or Matt? That, thank you, Councilor. Sure. Oh, good. oh, go ahead, Matt, if you no, I'll, I'll, I'll start, Nancy. So yeah, so there's, I guess, two things there. One is the worst case scenario, the Coyote Creek Trail actual entrance off of Ruth Ferrari is about 0.8 miles um, from, from the police training center. So if we cannot create a set, separate access, there we are relatively quick jog over to the trail for the recruits. Um, 
However, we are working hard to try and figure out a way to create direct access. Um, this is a county portion of the Caddy Creek Trail, as I'm sure you know right there. And so um, we have already initiated conversations with the county to see what the possibilities are. At this point in time, I'm not sure um, if it is possible, but we're gonna work really hard to try and make that happen. Okay, cool. All right, thank you, appreciate it. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, let's vote on Councilmember Jimenez's motion. Jimenez? Yes. Corrales? Aye. Cohen? Aye. Carrasco? Aye. Davis? Aye. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mayhem? Aye. Jones? Aye. Licardo? Aye. All right, uh, so that wraps up our work for tonight. We'll go to open forum for any members of the community who'd like to speak on any item not on the agenda. Brian, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I got hit with some really left field news um, and had to change my plan for basically the rest of my life, and that happened. And it was fair and it was righteous and and I'm grateful that I had the opportunity and a lot of that was from you. I can't discuss too much of the facts, but the last couple of weeks have been a real eye opener for me. What other people live under the cost of rent in the area and things like that. But you know, I've gotten up every morning and I've seen the sunset for 14 days. And I haven't done that in the past because I was so tired. And all of the stuff we're doing is really great and all the stuff that's going on. But if we don't have hope, um, it's for not actually. And that's one of the biggest things I think the last administration at the federal level didn't pursue for most of us is hope. Hope for our children, hope for other people's children, hope for the future. Hope someday um, we'll stop fighting wars and all that. No, that's outside the purview of the council, but even at the local level, we need hope. And I encourage all of you to instill that hope in your constituents because it's, sometimes it starts at the leadership level where we have, um, where us as citizens are worth it and that that hope is there for us. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Brian. Uh, Rhoda Fry. Good evening. I'm here to alert you of the possibility of increased rail freight rail traffic through San Jose. It starts with a massive expansion proposal at Lehigh Cements Terminal at the Port of Stockton to import more slag to the Bay Area. The materials would be shipped to the Bay Area by truck and rail with eight times more freight cars than today. This is why I urge the city of San Jose to examine the upcoming Port of Stockton EIR. Slag, a waste product from steel manufacturing, is used to produce slag cement. Although manufacturing slag cement uses less energy than conventional cement, the Sierra Club opposes it. In 2019, the city of Vallejo was desperate for jobs, mounted a seven-year battle to block a marine terminal and slag cement plant due to environmental and, and traffic concerns. As you may know, Lehigh Cement and Cupertino, California's number two polluter of sulfur, three for hydrochloric acid, four for PM 2.5, et cetera, has not been operating for about a year. We don't know exactly why. In the past three years, they've had 50 times more labor safety fines than Mitsubishi Southern California Cement Plant, which has more employees. In 2019, Lehigh Cement Kiln overheated, and the company reported at least $1.7 million in damage. Maybe they're out of limestone. It can't be lack for lack of demand. 22 cement consumption is way up in California and employment remains stable at seven, at seven other California cement plants. That said, I'm concerned about the possibility of Lehigh trying to install a slag cement plant or depot there. Regardless of where the materials wind up, San Jose would likely be impacted. So once again, I'm asking you tonight to please keep an eye out for the Lehigh Port of Stockton EIR and comment before it's too late. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone. Uh, the meeting's adjourned. Happy St. Patrick's Day. Thank you.